past 9, 10, and I know you have something else on your docket, and of course we're expecting the judge momentarily. So I'm going to call the court to order. A quorum is present. All legal notices have been posted. This court is duly called. Can I get a motion to open the court? So moved. Second. Got a motion from Dr. Garcia, second from <clears throat> Dr. Daniel, that we proceed. Any unreadiness? All those in favor, let it be known by using sign of voting. Aye. Those who are opposed, same sign. Chairs in the affirmative. Will the bailiff please open the court? All rise. The Dallas County Commissioner's Court is now in session for the December 2021 term. The Honorable John Wiley Price presiding. Please remain standing for the invocation. The invocation today will be given by our guest of Commissioner J.J. Koch. I have the tremendous honor to introduce Rabbi Benzie Epstein. He's known for his charisma, dynamism, and genuine love for every Jew. Rabbi Epstein is a driving force behind DATA, the Dallas Area Torah Association, and their programs. <clears throat> Each week, he delivers many classes, including the popular Breakneck Through the Bible. He is a native of Bones in New York and received his rabbinic ordination, ordin <clears throat> ordination in 1992 from Yeshiva Heikal Hal Talmud in Jerusalem. Rabbi Epstein enjoys basketball, construction projects, and meeting new people. His wife, Batya, is the uh, co-chair of Uniquely Ours and educational director of the Mikva Israel of Dallas. The Epsteins moved to Dallas as the founders of Data in 1992, and they have seven children. Rabbi Epstein. Thank you. Actually, eight. Eight. <laughs> <laughs> I was figuring out which one I was going to get rid of. But, uh, <laughs> I think we're in the right place for that. Um, all right, we live in a quite uh, interesting times, and, um, and the prayer is really something that is something that is universally needed, and um, something that hopefully we we turn to God and ask Him to please help us, give us the wisdom and insight to make the right choices and decisions to um, to further God's kingship in this world. And really, um, what you all do here is is quite. Um, is quite, um, you know, be under the scenes until it comes on top of the scenes. And uh, may God give you all the wisdom to make the right decisions. <coughs> I'm going to say it first in Hebrew and then uh, then in English. he who grants deliverance to kings and dominions to princes his kingship is a kingship of all worlds. He who rescued David, his servant, from the evil sword, who put a road through the sea and a path amid the mighty waters. May he bless, preserve, and guard, help, exalt, and make great and raise high our county commissioners and courts. May the supreme king of kings in his mercy sustain them in life and preserve them from all distress, sorrow, and hurt. May he save them. May the supreme king of kings in his mercy instill in their hearts compassion do good with us and with all Israel in their days and our days. May Judah be delivered and Israel dwell in security. And the Redeemer come to Zion. May this be his will. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. All right. And Commissioner Kutch has our first two resolutions. Judge, I have uh, asked the court for deference. Uh, Will you please, please? Please. please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, court. Uh, Is this for Sock? Yeah, this is for these. Well, uh, I think that is a great idea. <laughs> well, first of all, thank, thank the court. And more than anything, Dr. Hinojosa, Michael Hinojosa, can I ask you to come forward, please? You know, doctor, <clears throat> you know, we, we always talk about, you know, the prowess and the, the, the you know, the physical prowess. And, and, and we're always really proud that even, even little old bitty schools like Baylor, you know, they, they talk about, uh, you know, their, their physical problems. <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, there's also some academia going on 
simultaneously here, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm equally as proud. But doctor, we want to take this court and this community, first of all, I want to take the uh, opportunity to say thank you. Because during this pandemic over the last couple of years, the Dallas Independent School District augmented its operational processes to accommodate the citizens of this community and especially those of us in the southern sector in terms of access. Uh, Ellis Davis Fieldhouse became known as uh, the place uh, to COVID uh, outside. Then the judge came along and hijacked and went to Fair Park. But nonetheless, we, um, I just want to say thank you. E e easy access, easy access. And so on behalf of the citizens of Dallas County and, and those of us who got more shots during COVID than ever in our life, thank you. Just thank you for being a great partner. When we thought it was over, we had to call an audible and adjust. And you did that. When you had planned for your, your games and things to go forward, you know, we adjusted. We met on the, on the ground. And so again, I, I had to put that in the record because I always tell people at the end of the day, <clears throat> county is um, the reservoir of, of historical records. And uh, went back in and when we did that uh, presentation of the lynching a few weeks ago, found in the district clerk archives the notes around Mr. Brooks's lynching. Thank you, Ms. Petrie, and I got a chance to read them. I got them and figure out how to frame them. But it's nothing like county records, so let me just thank you. Whereas South Oak Cliff High School opened its doors to students in 1952 as the first DISD high school built since Lincoln High School opened in 1939. And whereas South Oak Cliff High School snowballed as it welcomed students in South and East Oak Cliff, and South was among the largest high schools in the city before the opening of Carter and Kimball. And whereas South Oak Cliff High School saw a dramatic demographic change between 1966 and 1970 where the student body went from being 100% white to almost 100% African American doing Dallas's version of the national white flight era. And where South Oak Cliff High School Golden Bears began and sustained a dynasty in athletics over the years and had a prominent alumnus, which includes names like Dennis Rodden, Harvey Martin, Egypt Allen, Michael Dimes, Nikesha Henderson, Wayne Morris, and scores of other standouts. I don't know how that didn't put Christy Gaines in there, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, yeah, that's okay, I, I got so many, had so many in my mind. I just want to put it for the oral. And whereas South Oak Cliff football team is headed by Clinton Jason Todd, whose grandfather, Frederick D. Todd, served as principal of the school during the glory days, which featured a stronger emphasis on academics as part of the athletics, as well as demanding excellence from his faculty, staff, and student body. And whereas South Oak Cliff School has a well-rounded football team, which includes Michael Trailer, Ellis Whitfall, Jacoby Walker, Kyle Ward, Wayne Ingram, Devin Allen, Dominique Spencer, Cranston Jones, James Davis, Keith Davis, James Gish, Christopher Pegram, and Marlon Reed. And where South Oak Cliff High School is led by Principal Dr. W. A. F. Johnson and Assistant Principal Michael Jones, Sheila, Sherry Branch, 
Marsha Potts, and Alan Gray, who all serve under the visionary leadership of Superintendent Dr. Michael Hinojosa. Therefore, be it resolved that the Dallas County Commissioner's Court proudly joins in with our citizens who rightly celebrate the South Oak Cliff Golden Bears as they claim the school's first ever 2021 State 5A Division II Championship. And I so move. Second. All those in favor? County Judge, Commissioner Price, and all the other commissioners court, thank you so much for honoring a great community. I grew up in the same community, maybe not as far south, and many times people have looked down upon us. And for 45,000 people, and a super, super majority of them showed up at the stadium, including you, Judge Jenkins, to rally these kids who have not only had victory on the field with discipline and a great coach, but they've also had victory in the classroom. Um, uh, Regions Bank, Frito-Lay, Microsoft were all industry partners at South Oak Cliff. Freddie, coach jo um, Principal uh, Johnson uh, talks about the GPA for these students was 3.42. So they're having victory in the classroom, but they're also lifting a community. And uh, December the 7th, 2015, a day that will be living in for me when I went to the school, and the community was very upset with the conditions of that building. But now, move forward, they have one of the best buildings in America, not only in a physical structure, but the soul and body of that school has made us all proud. And I thank you for your support, and I'm heading down to the parade, and I got my gold yeah. shirt on and my, my gold <laughs> shoes on, so I'm going to be a golden bear at least for today. So thank you so much. We're so honored on behalf of the student staff and the board. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank Commissioner Codge and the court for, for, for that indulgence. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Codge, you have the first or the next two resolutions. All right. Today I have the very distinct honor of honoring two incredible women of more amazing, just amazing careers with the district attorney's office. So first we have Ann Weatherholt. Whereas Ann Weatherholt will be retiring as soon as she finishes her last appellate brief or at the end of December, whichever is later, with 40 years of service to, Dal to the Dallas County uh, as an assistant district attorney to the appellate division of Dallas County District Attorney's Office, and whereas in 1968, Ann graduated from the University of Michigan with a BA in political science, received her law degree from Wayne State University in 1975, and whereas Ann's career in criminal law started in 1975 at the Criminal Justice Institute in Detroit, Michigan. In 1976, Ann joined the Wayne County, Michigan Prosecutor's Office. After being admitted to the Texas State Bar in 1981, she joined the Dallas County District Attorney's Office. <clears throat> Whereas, while working at the DA's office, Ann became known for her thorough analysis and clean to the point writing style. She quickly became a resource to police agencies all over the country who turned to her for advice on writing search warrants. Her knowledge of search and seizure is legendary and she helped countless trial prosecutors obtain lawful convictions over the years and whereas. A search of Ann's name in the Texas Appellate Court's search engine lists over 550 appellate briefs she researched, authored, and argued, although we know that there were many more cases that existed in the 80s that would not be captured in this modern search tool. And whereas, she's married to her husband, Robert, who in, in uh, 20. Oh, sorry, 2004, retired as Chief U.S. Probation Officer for the Northern District of Texas. They have two children and one grandchild. After a long career in, as a public servant, Anne looks forward to being retired so she can spend more time with her family. Now, therefore, be it resolved 
The Dallas County Commissioner's Court commends and thanks Ann Weatherholt for 40 years of diligent and faithful service to the citizens of Dallas County and the many county partners and constituency with <clears throat> whom she has served with distinction. We wish her the very best in her retirement. Amen. And I'll second. And I'll second. Thank you. in favor seem to be saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. I just want to thank you all for this. It's an, an honor. I've enjoyed working with Dallas County. I think this is the best county in the country. And uh, it seems like yesterday that I started over no, across the street in the White Horse. <laughs> <laughs> It was the White Horse, Cat Horse before it was the Allen Courthouse. Um, and then we moved into our current digs, which are now many years old. And um, been very, very happy. Thank you. Well, you, you've been here. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, Commissioner Cock and that recognition. You got, you got 40. I got 36 as a commissioner, 10. Sitting judge, I've been at 46. And I don't know how you can talk about it. it looked like it was just yesterday. yesterday. <laughs> these, these are dog years. And you, <laughs> and you have been just confined. I mean, you were at home, um, what do y'all call it, the commuting. You, you were commuting in one place before. You, I mean, I just can't even imagine, you know, y'all can't, can't move around. And you just, I mean, you've been right there apparently on it. And so I told him, I said, artfully done. Congratulations, and um, Paul, are you, you going to say anything? To... Oh. He, he, yeah. okay, so. Just briefly, on behalf of Judge Don Cruzo, who could not be here this morning, had planned on being here today, uh, on be and on behalf of the judge and the entire district attorney's office, I just want to congratulate her and tell her what a great job she's done for us, how much we appreciate her, and how much we wish her well in her retirement. Uh, the chief of her division, Jennifer Bolito, can do much more justice in terms of speaking mm -hmm. about her contribution to her office, and I want to defer to her. Judge? I'm Jennifer Bolito, and I'm the chief of the appellate section of the DA's office, and today is a very, very sad day for me because uh, Anne's leaving and, and Karen is leaving as well, and that represents 74 years of experience that is walking out of my section. Um, you know, criminal justice has changed a whole lot, and these ladies have uh, changed with it. And um, I, you know, Anne has been a mentor to me um, when I was in the in the appellate section of the DA's office uh, back in the 90s, and she continues to be a mentor for me. And when I became chief, she I asked her how long she was going to stay, and she goes, "One day I will be able to tell you I'm writing my last brief." And about uh, two weeks ago, she came in and told me. I'm, I'm writing my last brief, and so we are going to miss her, um, but we hope we can call on you when we need you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ann, for all your service. I appreciate it. Thank you. I just wanted to say, too, thank you on behalf of so many people who have, you know, most people have no idea what county government is or what Dallas County does, but it is exactly the people who bring their skills and talents, and then share it over time because your institutional knowledge, your knowledge of your areas of law, of what's of just practice uh, is, is so monumental. And I just wanted to say, you know, thank you so, so much. You know, kind of say that we can't do what we do without you. And you kind of need us a little bit too. Uh, but just also that we're not done yet, but it's on your shoulders that we are able to continue going forward and produce what we need to do for the benefit of all the people in Dallas County. So thank you so much for what you've done. And even with a smile on your face today. <laughs> uh, no, we can tell you're smiling. It's cool. It's all good. And Commissioner Koch, I, one more thing. I, I, I can't even imagine you having been in the office, but as she, as she sat here over the years and watched a different kind of district attorney's office, can nobody else <clears throat> probably say this with uh, skirts not so clean that she's had to and I'm, I'm, I keep going back to Brooks Love because she's been in a position to try to have to fortify what some people and this is me commentary what I consider prosecutorial misconduct 
It's called people that have to be, be deprived of their freedoms. But she's had to try to artfully again follow up and try to validate that in the legal terms. And so I, I really thank you. I, you know, I think Commissioner Daniels said it, but it, it's got to be a difficult job. And it's got to be a difficult job sometime when uh, you see stuff that you know probably um, should not be. So I, I want to thank you on behalf of, you know, it's a reason Dallas County, I tell Dr. Bernard, there's a reason Dallas County le leads the country in exonerations, number one, because y'all kept good record, not only in the DA's office, but especially in the forensic sciences. We were talking about that earlier in um, civil service. This office kept, kept the, 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 the kind of evidence that caused more exonerees to walk free than any other place in the country. And just want to thank you for that. Okay. You're another man. <laughs> thank you for your service. Come on over here. Thank you. Okay, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and I have the privilege of presenting the next resolution as well. And this one is for Karen Wise. Whereas Karen Wise will be retiring on December 31st, 2021, with 34 years of continuous service to Dallas County as an assistant district attorney in the appellate division of the Dallas County District Attorney's Office, and whereas Karen graduated from the University of Texas School of Law in 1984 and joined the Dallas DA's office in 1987. And whereas Karen has authored hundreds of criminal appellate briefs representing the state of Texas and has argued before the Fifth District Court of Appeals as well as the Texas Criminal Court of Appeals. And whereas since 2017 under Karen's leadership, the Dallas County Expunction Expo co-sponsored by the Dallas County DA's office and the Dallas County District Clerk's office has helped almost 2,000 people legally clear their criminal records. And whereas, in 2021 alone, the Expunction Expo gave more than 850 people the opportunity to clear their criminal records. This record number is attributed to Karen's recruitment and training of partner entities, including local law schools, criminal justice focused on profits, and the Dallas County Public Defender's Office, the City of Dallas Community Courts and City Attorney's Office, area attorneys, and local and national law firms and corporations. And whereas, Karen has used her extensive experience to train other DA's offices throughout Texas so they can offer members of their communities the opportunity to participate in Expunction Expo to clear their criminal records. And whereas, because of Karen's leadership, almost 2,000 citizens have rid themselves of the impediment of a criminal record, which has prevented them from obtaining employment, quality housing, or advanced education. And whereas, after a long career in public service, Karen will spend her retirement traveling, doing more community service, and spending time with her friends and family. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Dallas County Commissioner's Court commends and thanks Karen Wise for 34 years of diligent and faithful service to the citizens of Dallas County and many county partners and constituencies with which she served with distinction and wish her the very best in retirement. And I so move. Second. All those in favor of senior over saying aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. I'd like to thank the commissioners for having us here for such a wonderful acknowledgement. And I want to give a rah-rah for the Expunction Expo. It has been 
so important in so many people's lives. And we need to continue it. We need to expand it. We need to do it for these people every year. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be so emotional, but. Apology not accepted. <laughs> <laughs> because it's important, Man. so important. Right. So thank you. Yeah. It is, and it has been such an honor to work on it. And to work for this office, to work for this county, I'm truly grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, Karen started her uh, career with the DA's office um, trying to secure and maintain convictions for the victims of crime in Dallas County. But it was really a calling when she started doing uh, expunctions because those are victims of a different sort. Victims of uh, bad arrests, bad cases, cases that are dismissed, um, cases that are never filed but pop up on people's records. So um, uh, she is really doing justice in, bo in both of those roles. And so we have, um, besides just the expo uh, people, uh, the, the expunctions team of the DA's office uh, clears, how many did we do this year outside the expo? 2,000. Another 2,000 uh, expunctions. And, and you know, misuse of IDs, identity thefts, that sort of thing to try to straighten this out for people. So, um, Commissioner Price, I really appreciate you uh, bringing up how our office has changed. And I will tell you, um, you know, I've been, I've been there a while in a bunch of different administrations and we are trying our hardest to make sure that justice is done. Um, and I will also tell you just a short story uh, about Anne. Anne was, when I became chief of the, of the appellate section, Anne was one of the first people who uh, came in and said, look, you know, this is, this is wrong. We need to, we need to uh, concede error on, on this case. And so, um, and there are many times that, that we try to work around the, ru the rules with expunctions to try to make sure that, that as many people as possible can benefit from an expunction as well. And Karen and I have worked on that. So again, I'm, it's a sad day for me because I'm losing 74 years of experience, but it's also a glorious day to, to champion these ladies and what they've done for Dallas County, for the citizens in Dallas County. Uh, thank you. That, oh, you know, what you gonna say? Yes, I just wanna thank you, Ms. Weiss, for your passion, for your caring, for <clears throat> everything you do. It's easy to say, you know, that there's a process to clean your record, but sometimes it's very difficult, you know, for many of these people, mainly people of color, to think, to even think that there could be justice after what they've gone through. A lot of them, very young people who made mistakes during their high school years, and, you know, very young that want to change. And, I have the opportunity to attend many of the expansions, some of them virtual, and you can hear the passion and the families uh, with hope for an opportunity for one of their kids or their husbands or their sons and brothers to make a change and have a better life. So it couldn't happen without people like you who have that courage and that passion to continue it. And I know they, District Attorney's Office is committed to this program, and we appreciate everything you do. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Petrie, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Koch, if you will, Ms. Petrie, come forward. Yeah, I, you know, I'm I, I'm I'm following up on this because you know, and I, I want first of all I want to thank <clears throat> Judge Jenkins and Commissioner Koch and those who appeared at the uh, unveiling of the uh, plaque at the lynching of Mr. Allen Brook. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was something about spirit in that day, but uh, I followed back up, uh, and I'm back to the records of history and uh, found them over in the archives in the district clerk's office. It, it's interesting, we're talking about a man who was taken and, and, and lynched in this county and this is the same office that is helping to kind of parlay all this expansion, et cetera. But, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I. And I think there's, there's 66 books somewhere that talks about how many times you forgive them. They fall down seven times and seven times. 
I know y'all don't believe, but I do read. I read around it anyway. <laughs> and I work, and I'm, and you know, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm glad. Like I said, um, old black folks used to say, "I'm just glad he, you know, left left me here a little longer to try to try to get this right." Cause it's rough to wake up and to read some of this stuff. And uh, I'm I'm back to. I can't fathom being locked up for years. Years, decades, the stuff you didn't do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I, I, I can't do it. Remember, this court may not remember, but history will remember. Nine years, five months, 24 days. Joyce Ann Brown, justice denied. When she came out, she went to work for the county. And I'll never forget, her book is Joyce Ann Brown, Justice Denied. She's no longer, she's transitioned now. But, uh, and I'll just say this, this, this is me. That, that was one of those resolutions I stood up and said not only no, but hell no. When we had a person who had prosecuted and, and considered themselves to be very proud of what they had done. But this woman was away from her daughter for almost 10 years. And they found the other Joyce that she just got through talking about, Joyce Brown. Not the same person. But show sure how God works. We heard the examining trial in George Allen in Judge Cleo Steele's court that night. <clears throat> Joyce Ann Brown. And they came in and testified that she was at work, but yet still, we set, took 10 years of her life. Randall Dale Adams, happened to be Anglo. Nanelle Jeter, an African-American engineer. Anglo never let history forget none of them. He robbed in Balk Springs of Kentucky chicken or something. They said the man was at work. Thank you for that uh, archive piece, Ms. Peach. And we got to figure out how to get access to some money to, to, so we're not digging through all that dead gum. I guess they said, my court members say I'm the one to talk all that paper over there, that old paper. And I, I got an aversion for old paper. But uh, to get that stuff archived in a way that we can get access. I have a plan, Commissioner. You got a plan? I have a plan. Glad to hear it. And it won't cost Dallas County any money. Won't cost them money? No money. I'm with that plan. Okay. Step up. <laughs> Keep on thinking. I just wanted to be here to personally step, thank. Step up a little closer, Ms. Peacher. I just wanted to personally thank Karen Wise for her work on the Expunction <clears throat> Expo. Um, five years ago, um, we met to, to do this, and she was... She was extremely excited. It's a lot of work, um, a lot of work that most district attorneys will not tackle, but Dallas County decided to do it. And each year you see the excitement grow. Each year you see the number of people wanting to participate. Um, this year, um, there was a gentleman, he had, he had a record for 61 years. 61 years his record had been cleared, but it never taken off. Um, and his son um, actually accompanied him as he walked across the stage to receive his paperwork. And that is the rewarding part of what we do. Yes, it's a lot of hard work, um, but it's worth it. It's worth it for the citizens of Dallas County. We are going to miss Karen Wise and her leadership um, when it comes to Expunction Expos. I will certainly miss calling and saying, Karen, can I slide just one more in? And she'll always say, of course, Ms. Petrie. Um, Dallas County has been fortunate to have her, and the district clerk office will certainly miss her being there. Thank you, Karen. Upon these shoulders, we will go forward. So thank you, thank you, thank you for providing that platform so that, in fact, we can, and the importance of all of those individuals because I was unable to attend the, the Expunction Expo. But I see every day people who are then able to lease an apartment, 
to go out and get a job, to have pride in themselves because they, yes, there is value that they can, you know, provide for their families and for themselves. So I see the results of the kinds of efforts that, that uh, you go forward with. So thank you so much. Your shoulders will be missed, but they have been there. So you leave something very important behind. Thank you. And thank you, my dear. <clears throat> well, yeah, I just want to conclude by thanking you again. Um, prosecutors, right? I mean, you know, we're supposed to prosecute. But it's the, the amazing thing that, you know, really and you hear about it and, and I, maybe uh, folks outside uh, DA's work, that your job is to do justice. It is. And that's the reason why there's so much written, so many stories about lawyers. Because at the heart of that, right, you're supposed to be the zealous advocate for the victim. But if there's times, you absolutely must step back and do the very hard thing and look at the overall and see if justice is being done. That is not the power of intellect. That is the power of character. And I, I, we are very blessed that you have that tremendous character to be able to do that so very well and do justice. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Price has our next resolution. Okay. Ms. Troxel. Rebecca Gwynn Troxel. And the delegation from that criminal justice side of the aisle. <clears throat> and the reason the, this one is, is, is really interesting as well. You know, we got a lot of good people in Dallas County, and they plowed through a lot of deals. When we bought this, to most of the judges <clears throat> in this uh, county, we were embarrassed because we had a little bitty county named Midland County with probably, I mean, if y'all are from Midland, don't, don't take offense, but, you know, two judges. And they were doing more than all of our judges. And but the number of judges, yeah, I mean, they, they just refused to utilize this program would not step out. And, and again, this program is, again, about trying to, you know, a, a, as we get attacked a number of times, people are presumed innocent, and most of them haven't been convicted. In cases they're there for me. So, anyway. This one, this, this resolution says where Dallas County makes a special note of its employees who dedicate their careers toward the betterment of all of our citizens. And then whereas Rebecca Wynn Truxel is a native Floridian hailing from Madison and is a proud graduate of CHEO High School in Cameron, Texas and received a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Southwest Texas State University, now known as Texas State in San Marcos. And whereas Rebecca Gwen Truxel began her criminal justice career as a juvenile probation officer in Bell County, Texas in 1977. And whereas Rebecca Gwen Truxel began her first career with Dallas County in 1981 as an adult probation officer, having served honorably and faithfully for 28 years, having retired as an assistant supervisor in what then was known as the Alternative Sentencing Work Release Program. And whereas Rebecca Gwen Truxel began her second career, always a second career with Dallas County, after a break-in service, in August 2009, as the manager of the newly formed Alternative 
Sentencing Electronic Monitoring Program established under the Commissioner's Court, and whereas Rebecca Gwen Truxell took on an additional responsibility in June 2010 for pretrial bond electronic monitoring program. And whereas Rebecca Gwen Truxell is married to Dan, who is a retired federal special agent and former contract court security officer for the United States Northern District of Texas, and they share a love for their daughter, Jennifer, who works for the United States Department of Agriculture. And whereas Rebecca Gwen Trucks, after 40 years, well, this 40 looks like that's the, that's, that's the crossover. <laughs> if you ain't been here 40 years, you ain't done nothing. <laughs> whereas Rebecca Gwen Trucks, after 40 years of combined service to the people of Dallas County, in the criminal justice system finds that physical limitations have finally dictated she start a new chapter in life, therefore be it resolved that the Dallas County Commissioner's Court now congratulate Rebecca Gwen Truxell as she announces a well-deserved retirement and earnestly offer our best wishes to her committed service on behalf of the citizens of Dallas County, and I so move. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. <laughs> we want to start with you talk first, Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Steele. You're supposed, to, you're, supposed to, you're supposed to, you you know about all this arm wrestling, how we got here. She's just not going to let you have the pony. It, it's okay. It's okay. She's going to okay. tell you 51 million. Okay. 51 million? You already know. You got it. I just wanted to extend a thank you to the court for all the patience that y'all showed us when we originally started this program. We couldn't come up with a double digit number for a long time. Um, when we started with COVID, we had just hit 300 active cases. And uh, since then, we've been knocking on the door of 900 active cases. We've provided services to over 8,000 inmates that we've gotten out of jail. And we've saved the county over $51 million in jail bed cost. I could not have done it without y'all's support, but most especially without the support of my team an amazing group of, of young people, energetic to no end, all through COVID, they were there with me every single day. Even when the courthouse was locked down and we had to beg our way into the building so that we could get people out of jail, they were there every day. They're a great group. I hate to leave them, but the time has come that I have to do so. I thank you guys for your support and um, that's all I have to say. You want to introduce that delegation that's somewhere uh, surrounding you there? <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite a... Well, there, there's my husband and my Oh, daughter. he had to pull off his oh. mask for you to identify? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's time for you to retire. Uh, uh, <laughs> of course, Mr. Steele and Mr. Segura and, and, and Leah Gamble, who helped bring me into this, and then a, a bunch of our crew back here who, who've come to share support today. Okay, Ms. Steele. I just wanted to say thank you. My introduction has only been nine years hearing your voice at Jail Sanitation and talking about uh, the challenges, but then also the successes of what you've been able to do, um, uh, being incredibly creative with the resources you had at hand. And it seemed like we always needed more hands and more hands. Um, but you have definitely shown what it takes to, first of all, you know, know where you're headed with things and then to make it work. So, you know, my introduction to, uh, to uh, the ELM has been through your voice and just, you know, kind of keeping things on track. So you will be sorely missed. There is no doubt about that. But I know that you're not done yet. You're going to figure out some way to uh, keep things moving and keep things happy. So thank you. Judge, Commissioner Price, uh, commissioners, we just want to thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Price, for supporting this um, resolution. Uh, Gwen has definitely been a staple 
uh, here in Dallas County and especially mm -hmm. since pretrial services has gotten started and I just can't tell you how much I appreciate the mentorship that she's given me over the past few years so we did we're just gonna miss her uh, but we wish her well in her new endeavors uh, there's a there's a rap artist say first y'all didn't want me now I'm hot you all don't act like y'all don't know the song. Uh, you know, at first y'all didn't want me, now I'm hot y'all all on me. Uh, you know, you know, and, and, and I think and I and I say that some tongue in cheek, but what I what I'm back to Midland again. You know, no but they, they didn't want it. They didn't want it. And now what we find ourselves trying to manage doing jail population and all is now it just looks like that funnel. I mean, everyone was, I mean, they were coming, and they were coming in such a way that it required uh, this team here to make adjustments. And some of us said, hey, hey, that, that, that doesn't belong over here. They said, that's all right, let's try it anyway. And, and it did. And when they say $51 million, taxpayers still don't understand that pre-pandemic, we had gotten that jail down to $9 million a month. That's your cost, taxpayers, every month. It's not about people being guilty and custody. That's $9 million you were paying pre-pandemic. Now, you're paying $12 million every month. But see, they just said, just because of that program, they say $51 million bed days. I mean, we, you know, they, you know, this thing, we don't just take this and just Sit up, sit up here and sit around. We work these committees. We work. We ask for accountability. You know, we are a, a, a responsible counter and one to be modeled. But I just want to thank this team and, and Becca. Just, 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 you know, just, just thank you because you, you had a hard, you had a hard time. Nobody, nobody wanted to say, I, I don't know about that monitoring stuff. And, and when you look at the numbers, Y'all haven't lost anybody. Y'all haven't lost anybody. You know, what, what was interesting to me is if they, if they cut that monitor off at midnight, they, they, they knew it, and they were all on it. And frankly, I said I'm going to go wade into this, but some of these folks, they got on monitors now. Um, and I, you know, they've been, I know they're not guilty yet, but... Got to, got some got to, you got you got you got some got a different population on monitoring now. So it's a good time to retire. I got you. <laughs> and in, on that note, Wayne, thank you so much. I I definitely can understand the challenge. But uh, we talked all morning already about the changes in criminal justice and the different challenges that we had before the pandemic and now after post pandemic. But it couldn't be done without people like you, Wayne, and of course, Mr. Steele, Mr. Segura, and your department leadership. You have adjust to every single change. The jail did not stop during the pandemic either. And we have increased personnel, we have increased judiciary involvement, we have increased uh, communication with you know, the people we serve. And it couldn't happen without people that say, okay, mm -hmm. you know, we're gonna roll over our sleeves and we're gonna keep working. I mean, this pandemic can stop it. And we talk about cost, and yes, it's very important, that's part of our job. But we also talk about people affected by this. And you all, you know, done that job to the dot. And I'm very proud of that department as the chair of the Criminal Justice Advisory Board. I know how many times you have come asking, requesting for additional staff for a different location, for protection from everything that brought this pandemic brought to the, to the office. When I know that you were right there for four years telling the team how you could do it. And like Commissioner Price said, I think it was a good time to retire because you really, really served Dallas County honorably, proudly. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. Thanks for all you did. Enjoy that retirement.
And, and believe it or not, you, it, when we ha we've had to go up to that 1100 building, some of us go up for different things, but that 1100 building, that the court, the difference has been these kind of programs have helped us to show that Dallas County was making that effort, that this court was funding these programs, and you know, I know it was stretched sometime. What, what was that, 900 folks you had? I know it was a lot. But you kept going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank all of you. Take care of And Dr. Daniel has our next two resolutions. The next resolution is for Joe Watts. Is Joe here? I don't think I've seen him yet. I did want to take a moment to read this because it is the recognition of 24 years of service. So, whereas the Dallas County Commissioner's Court takes special notice when an individual is given long and faithful service to Dallas County, Mr. Joseph Joe Watts has diligently served Dallas County for 24 years. And whereas Joseph Watts began his career with Dallas County on March 1st, 1996, in the Dallas County Constable Office, Precinct 2. While assigned there, he worked as a civil deputy. In 2001, he transferred to Dallas County Constable Office, Precinct 5, where he worked as a civil and traffic deputy. In, two, in uh, ba -da -da, Mr. Watts, where did it? in 2008, he transferred back to Precinct 2 as a traffic deputy. And whereas during his career with Dallas County, Mr. Joe Watts worked in several positions which made him an extremely knowledgeable employee who knew how to get the job done. Mr. Watts was known for being a dependable and hardworking employee. Whereas in 2010, he was transferred from the constable office and assigned to the Dallas County Clean Air Task Force as an investigator. When the task force was defunded, Mr. Watts returned to the Dallas County Constable Office Precinct 2, where he finished his career with Dallas County. And whereas Mr. Watts was born in Dallas, Texas, he attended Lake Highlands High School, the Eastfield College Police Academy, and Tarrant County College Police Academy. And whereas Joe Watts served on the Deputy Reserves Constable Association as Vice President and as Chairman. And whereas Joe Watts is married to Jennifer Lynn Watts, they have two children, Jessica and Justin. He enjoys cooking, playing drums, camping, reading, exercising, and weightlifting. So congratulations to Mr. Watts on his retirement. May he have all the time to spend it with his family and friends and to enjoy his free time on new projects. Now therefore be it resolved, the Dallas County Commissioner's Court does hereby recognize and extend sincere appreciation to Joe Watts for 24 years of faithful service and further express his best wishes on his retirement, and I so move. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, and that will be presented to him very soon. This has been the morning of retirements. And I hope you do recognize the number of years of experience, of knowledge that are walking out the door. Uh, none will be missed more than uh, Janet Butcher. 
So would uh, Janet and those folks who uh, have worked with her, have supported her, have uh, created that part of the team that keeps things going. Yeah, please come forward. I am glad you're still in This is the person who has always kept the trains on time, and so it's been very much appreciated. So, whereas Janet Butcher began her career with Dallas County in 1996 also in the auditor's department in payroll, and has held that same position on her, until her retirement on December the 17th, 2021, completing 25 years of service. You realize that she's on her own time today. <laughs> yeah, I had to get up early today. <laughs> <laughs> and whereas Janet Butcher has been a go-to person within Dallas County and has a wealth of knowledge and experience, she was always willing to help Dallas County employees through resolving issues in order to get employees paid correctly and on time. And whereas Janet will be remembered as the person who would find a way to get the answer, she used her long experience and deep knowledge of the inner workings of the budgetary process and related systems to figure out usable solutions. Janet's creativity knew no bounds in finding the way to get the job done. Dallas County will always be grateful for the tools she provided so that we could make better budget decisions. And whereas Janet was born and raised in Dallas, attended J.J. Pierce High School in Richardson, before graduating from Texas Tech with a bachelor's in accounting. And whereas Janet lives with family Michelle, Jim, and sister Dee, Dee plus her fur family of dogs Charity and Sadie, cats Fluffy, Mittens, Louie, and Cheeto. Don't forget That's Cheeto. A lot of cats. <laughs> the whole gang plans to travel as much as possible in a newly purchased RV to explore the United States and take up residency in the other end of the state of Texas. Now therefore be it resolved that Dallas County Commissioner's Court does hereby convey its best wishes to Janet Butcher as she celebrates 25 years of serving the citizens of Dallas County and hopes that she enjoys her well-deserved retirement effective December, the 27th, December 17th, 2021. And I so move. And I second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Well, it's been quite the ride. In um, the spring of 1996, I had a crappy job. A friend of mine worked here, said, hey, we got a payroll manager position open. Why don't you come apply? And I said, because I can't live on that salary. So, nevertheless, I decided that either I was going to have to flip hamburgers or come to work at Dallas County. So, I had an interview. Uh, Dempsey Tarver hired me. Joe Jack Mills said she'll never stay. She's, gonna, she's never going to stay. Every time I'd see him at a Christmas celebration or a retirement party for years, he would say, really? You're still there. <laughs> and I'd say, it's my home now. So, here I am, leaving my home. It's been a great ride. These guys standing behind me are my friends, a lot of them. One of the reasons I'm leaving is because they're, they're retired and I need to go play with them. <laughs> so <laughs> it's been fun. If you're ever in South Padre, you can find me on the beach. Come on down. <laughs> um, you know, 25 years of dedicated service to Dallas County is a great contribution that Janet Butcher has given to us. Uh, all the employees of Dallas County have gotten their paychecks. <laughs> she has been the person to make sure that happens over the years. Uh, a lot of historical knowledge is walking out of the door. You know, in accounting, we have a terminology that's cradle to grave. Um, I like to use that for her. Janet was here at the beginning of the Oracle system. She helped design the Oracle system. 
and she's had the opportunity to look at what's coming in the future, and she's been able to, to participate in the new ERP system. So she's had both ends of that process. And we wish her the best in the next stage of life, in her retirement. Knowing Janet, I know she will have fun. <laughs> she always brought fun. So who did you bring with you, Janet? Uh, well, so this is Michelle. Um, Dee Dee is back here, back, the short person in the back. Um, some payroll staff, Brenda, LaVonda, Shamika, uh, uh, what's her name? <laughs> I've been gone for three days, y'all yeah, already got other days. Uh, uh, Wesson's obviously here. Ermit, Gloria, two of my dear friends that have already, like, retired. Uh, they were nice enough to come back. Leah also already retired, was nice enough to come down today. Uh, Shirley's back there from HR. Um, so it, it's been fun. It's been really fun. That's the one thing that was your, 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 your hallmark was if you can't do it without a little bit of fun, then it's probably not worth doing. Absolutely. In the meantime, though, you did get payroll out on time, regardless of what was going on in the bigger world out there. Well, so you most certainly will be missed, but I also know, too, that Mr. Thomas, you know, civil service this morning is testament to uh, the planning that Mr. Thomas has done, in recognizing that there were some changes. There's going to be a generational change coming on. Um, but to make sure that the residents of Dallas County can depend on um, continuing to get those checks on time. <laughs> but anyway, Janet, thank you, thank you, thank you, and to all the team uh, that have come by. It's good to see the folks who have retired and coming back to say um, they miss some of that fun too, don't they? Yes. Well, uh, so it finally hit me, Alexis. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, it's just one of those things. Michelle, I know you want to do it. Go ahead. Actually, I just wanted to um, do a little speech on behalf of our friends. I've been sent here on the Urban Tribe, and um, it's just a really short one. Um, we, uh, as friends, I, I, I was friends with JB before I came to the county. Thank God she talked me into coming. It's been a wonderful ride for both of us. Jim couldn't be here because he, was, he unfortunately got sick Saturday. But we wanted to talk about one little thing, and it was kind of a funny thing, so we wanted to share it with uh, Commissioner Price. Commissioner. <laughs> um, He's got that look on now. <laughs> it's, a really, it's really kind of funny. Uh, we've, we've been on vacations all over the world. We have been at restaurants. We have been at Broken Bow, Oklahoma, camping, and I remember, this was even before I came to the county, that Commissioner Price, somebody from Commissioner Price's office called. We didn't think we even had sale, but JB answers her phone. And uh, it was kind of funny, and the person says, Commissioner Price would like to talk to you. And we're all like, what? <laughs> and, and, and reality set in that JB works for the county, of course. She's on call all the time. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, one of the things is that that's been our life uh, forever, is that every one of you guys knew you could call JB anytime you wanted. You could ask her anything you wanted because you know that she, even though it wasn't her department, she had knowledge and everything else. She uh, would answer it. And um, I have this little thing that you called her because uh, – you knew she was 95% of the time right, but we all know that JB thinks she's 100% of the time right. <laughs> but we, we want to tell you that our venture is, is just starting, and uh, next year uh, we're, we're all moving to South Padre, and we're going to remodel our house, and that's what JB's chart, her duties are at this time. And we've been excited, and we're, uh, we got our plans, and the county is going to miss JB more than anything as I will because she'll be in South Padre and I'll be stuck here with Jim. <laughs> Thank you. I could talk about JB all day, but I know y'all have other business. Appreciate well, you I, indulging me. Thank you so much for that story. You know, the thing is Commissioner Price thinks he's 100% of the time right, too. <laughs> um, with that being said, uh, Janet, we are going to miss you. 
I mean, talking, we have been talking about criminal justice and money the whole morning. And the reality, you know, you always knew the most difficult situations, you will help us. Ermit, it's good to see you as well. As a member of the Public Employee Benefits Committee with the judge, uh, it, it's, we had a lot of issues that we couldn't solve without your knowledge, without your insight, and without your compassion as well. Uh, I love Janet Butcher, not only because she's smart and she's outspoken and she says what she has to say. I also love her for her love to animals. And you hear how many of them she has, but she also cares for others and fosters for others. And uh, one of the biggest supporters of all the initiatives that I have uh, in Dallas County has been Janet Butcher. And she will pick up the, the phone and call me and say, hey, that is the right way to go. Keep doing it. And I know that in South Padre, there's going to be a lot of new animals that will have homes, <laughs> thanks to Janet Butcher. Probably some turtles, too. <laughs> I, why not? You know, <laughs> doing the thing. right thing is not always easy. But Janet, you have made it look easy. I'm sorry I couldn't be in your retirement party last week, but you know that you have our appreciation from all of us. And thank you, Commissioner Daniels, and um, you know for indulging me in giving one before today. So, muchísimas gracias, and have fun. And if I go to South Padre, I will look for Janet you, Butcher. You know, I, I said a lot of times I probably should change my number, but. Too many people have it, and I would never. What do happened that. with all Come your? Come on down. What <laughs> happened with all your friends <laughs> that have retired and are going to find it? You know, put a caller ID, and if we call, just don't answer. <laughs> well, if it says six five three one one six seven, I'm definitely not answering. <laughs> have fun. out the door, Janet, um, my, my comment's going to be, you only know that you're really missed when it takes more than one person to replace you. Um, on the, as, as one of the continuous improvement committees and Mr. Thomas's reorganization as we continue to look at Oracle and all of that, um, we, we recognize we, the, the dynamics are changing. And, uh, while I'm, I'm probably, you know, one of the, you know, legacy individuals of, of, of paper, um, that it's, it's a changing dynamic, and Oracle is, is going to be different. So it'll take more than one person to replace you. Yep. That's for sure. Okay, Judge, it's on you, man. All right. I have the final resolution of this morning recognizing our employees of the year. Two of the resolutions were not exported to iCompass, so they are not posted, but we're going to read them into the record today. As we close our employee recognition program for this year, it is important to stop and recognize how the county's workforce continues to rise to the challenge 
in these unprecedented times. Throughout this year, 118 employees have been presented with resolutions from Commissioner's Court for being named Employee of the Month. We are grateful for each one and how each one helps us achieve our goals and objectives at Dallas County. From these 118 employees, one person from each department has been selected as a finalist for Employee of the Year. We have divided the departments into four categories based on the scope of service. The categories are constituent services, county operations, courts and justice administration, and law enforcement. At this time, I will announce each finalist for employee of the year. If they are here, please come forward so you can be recognized and we can take a picture. They are Alejandro Rodello from, from the district clerks, and he's up for constituent services. Daryl Young from Public Works, constituent services. Rosa Romero, tax office, constituent services. Rachel Rita, emergency management, county operations. Yordanos Malaki, criminal justice, courts and justice administration. Lupita Rendon, District Attorney, Courts and Justice Administration. Thomas King, Juvenile, Courts and Justice Administration. Jessica Gomez, Pretrial, Courts and Justice Administration. Mary Walton, Fire Marshal, Unincorporated Services, Law Enforcement. Danny Clare, Sheriff, Law Enforcement. Fire Warden John Cannon, Sheriff, Law Enforcement, Richard Wien, Sheriff, Law Enforcement, and Lisa, Lisa Taylor, Sheriff, Law Enforcement. One person from each of these categories will be named as our Employee of the Year. Shall we take a picture, y'all? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Mary Walton. Congratulations, y'all, for being finalists. Have a seat and see who, who came out. Is there a drum roll? On these, yeah, we get a drum roll here in a minute. All right. Drum roll. Do we have a drum roll, Shay? I just need to do it now. At least a walk up music. Our employee of the year for constituent services is Alejandro Rodeo from the District Clerk's Office. manages all three passport offices for Dallas County. His vast wealth of knowledge regarding passports is evident when he performs or completes his tasks or projects. He takes initiatives with ensuring proper procedures and protocols to ensure that they're in place and handled accordingly. He regularly meets with his staff to provide updated information regarding travel requirements mandated by the Department of State. Most recently, Alex stressed the importance of gender verification on passport applications and trained his staff on the appropriate manner to address transgender customers. Mr. Rodea uses his leadership ability to influence, motivate, and enable others to contribute toward the organizational success. His transformational leadership style inspires his staff to do better and heighten their morale. Mr. Rodea is currently enrolled in the Dallas County Leadership Program. He is learning and applying some of the leadership skills in his daily operations. He's resourceful, 
and consistently looks for opportunities to improve the process of the passport office. Mr. Rodea is a team player and helps in other areas of the district clerks and department. His experience with e-filing has proven valuable while assisting the file desk, family courts, and civil courts with backlogs. Alejandra has, was instrumental in representing the district clerk's office in ensuring that the renovation of the North Dallas Passport Office was successful. From the closure of the old office on Marsh Lane to the move in and make ready of the new office, Alex took charge. He was invited to give the invocation of the groundbreaking of the Oak Cliff Government Center by Commissioner Garcia and the invocation at Commissioner's Court. Alex leads by example. He is always looking for creative ways to enhance the customer's experience. In addition to encouraging and boosting the morale of his direct reports, the district clerk's department is fortunate to have Alex as a member of their leadership team. And as we strive to re in reimagine customer service through experience. I move adoption of this resolution recognizing Alejandro Rodea as the Dallas County Employee of the Year for Constituent Services. Is there a second? Second. 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 All in favor uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. District uh, Clerk Felicia Petrie, uh, begin with any remarks you may have, and then we'll hear from Alex. I'm so excited for Alex. Alex is, he is certainly a public servant. Um, we can call on him for anything. He's, he's a forward thinker. Um, I have great plans for him. Um, encouraging Alex to pursue a higher education, um, plan to invest in him personally. Um, you can ask for a more humble, a more dedicated, more caring individual. I am extremely excited that he has been selected. We have, um, we have already planned some things for him this afternoon. He has no clue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, the district clerk's office is just extremely proud of him. And I'm, I'm thankful. Um, Alex was with us every day um, throughout COVID. Although um, our passport office was closed, he came in every day and helped out with our e-filing. Um, there's nothing that you don't ask him to do that he's not willing to do. I was able to turn over the renovations for the North Dallas office to him and he handled it um, as a pro. So Alex, congratulations. I am thankful that he's a part of my management team. Thank you everyone for the recognition. Commissioners, thank you for the honor for selecting me. Um, you know, I had to thank God first. Um, it is he who I represent first and foremost, but I also represent you all, the Dallas County, I represent Ms. Petrie, I represent my wife, my sons, my church family. Um, I'm just grateful and honored to work for Dallas County and I appreciate you all. Um, it's been a journey, but I continue to grow. I continue to look forward to greater things for not just me, but for my team. Although the certificate will say employee of the year, it's employees because I wouldn't be here without my staff. They, they're the ones that make me look good as well. Thank you all. Thank you Thank so you. much. We do nothing by ourselves, and we need you so much in order to get the work done in Dallas County. And to do it in such a, 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 a uplifting way makes it a lot easier for us than to do our jobs. So thank you so much. Well, congratulations, Mr. Rodela and Ms. Petrie, your team, mm -hmm. you know, the services, you know, especially at the passport office where you know Mr. Rodela knows all the details that are entitled into the operation. And your team, Mr. Rodela, you and Ms. Petrie done a fabulous job. Thank you. I mean, I, I know that I have referred so many people that are in dear you know, situations and you've been able to help them. So thank you very much. Felicidades. Y muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. 
you want to get it with us? Congratulations. All right, congratulations again. Now for our next award, our 2021 Employee of the Year for County Operations is, drum roll, Rachel Ruida from the Homeland Security and Emergency Management Department. Rachel has continuously demonstrated the high level of work ethic and professionalism during the pandemic over the last year. She has worked from the office on a regular and continuous basis in order to assist residents who called our office assisting information on testing and vaccine. Many of these callers spoke only Spanish and Rachel used her knowledge as a Spanish speaker to answer questions and direct residents to websites and other sources of information. Without this capability, our office would not have been able to respond to these residents in a timely and meaningful manner. Our department continually seeks ways to serve all our community, and Rachel has gone beyond what is normally expected of an employee to add a high level of service. Rachel has worked diligently during the pandemic period to ensure that our testing sites and vaccine sites had the equipment needed to maintain operations and services. These sites are located throughout Dallas County. And as the office manager, she has constantly and professionally managed the associated budgets, purchase orders, and requisitions. Rachel has supported members of the emergency management team, providing team support during the pandemic period. The team could not have accomplished our goals and objectives without the assistance of Rachel and her get it done attitude. I move adoption of this resolution recognizing Rachel Rita as a Dallas County Employee of the Year for County Operations. Uh, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Uh, Signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. <laughs> Scott, if you'll represent the department with any remarks. Absolutely. First and foremost, thank you for recognizing Rachel and her valuable contributions to Dallas County. Um, post COVID, Rachel has done so much for, for Dallas County and our department. Um, I don't know if you've ever, most of you have had the opportunity to speak with her, but she's such a joy to talk to. No matter how hectic things get, she just has that positive attitude regardless, regardless of what happens. So on behalf of the department, Rachel, thank you for everything you do to support our department and Dallas County. Uh, you are a true gem and we just appreciate everything that you have done for us. Thank you everyone, it's an honor. I was not expecting this, uh, but without a great team, I wouldn't do what I do. So thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias, Ms. Reda. When it comes to public safety, it's yes. not only one language, it's more than one. And you have done it very, very well. Thank you thank so you. much. All right, y'all want to get a picture? Thank you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait, Thank you so much. It's time for our next award and our 2021 Employee of the Year for Courts and Justice Administration is Thomas King from Juvenile. From the On 
onset of the pandemic, Mr. King has shown extraordinary leadership and true dedication to the Dallas County Juvenile Department. In March 2020, all in-person court proceedings were immediately halted, and the decision was made to have all court hearings virtually. Mr. King, without hesitation, went into action to ensure the juvenile department remained in compliance with this mandate. He was able to gather the necessary electronic equipment for his officers to establish hotspots, cell phones, etc., to ensure the operations of the department continue to run efficiently. Additionally, Mr. King notifies all department staff of weekly court settings. He modifies court procedures when necessary and gives clear expectations of the judge's instructions. He ensures that all pertinent documents are gathered, maintained, and distributed to the appropriate court for the necessary signatures. Furthermore, he personally reviews all Texas Juvenile Justice Department packets to ensure all the necessary paperwork is in place before a youth is transported. During this time, Mr. King has stepped up tremendously to maintain staff coverage wherever there is a need. He does this without being asked or prompted to do so, and he does it again without hesitation. His level of commitment to this department has been unwavering even during a time where there has been some uncertainty. He continues to maintain a great work ethic and a positive attitude. Recently, Judge Cheryl Shannon sent an email commending him for his service to the department, writing, Mr. King has gone above and beyond the call of duty during the pandemic. He has ensured that the court's electronic proceedings are set up and ready to go for each hearing. He has navigated between courts and not once has complained that he was functioning outside his responsibilities. He agreed to keep the equipment in safekeeping and took ownership of the process. Our virtual process would not have been successful without him. Kudos to Mr. King. I move adoption of this resolution recognizing Thomas King as the Dallas County Employee of the Year for Courts and Justice Administration. Second. Second. All those uh, in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries unanimously. <laughs> All right. Congratulations, uh, Mr. King. You know, we, we really appreciate the juvenile department, appreciate you recognizing um, Mr. King's contributions to the department. Um, we do know, though, that without his dedication, his commitment to, to our juvenile, our youth um, in this community, that we wouldn't be successful at this. Um, it's, it's him, his 25 years of service, is coming in every day since the pandemic. Um, he has not missed a day, and we appreciate that. You know, we were actually just sitting down, and he was talking about um, getting his 11 o'clock docket ready. Um, and so it, it's something that, um, that he does with maximum effort, um, but more than that, um, he does it with execution. Um, he is committed to what we do in the juvenile department. I'm also committing to the fact that he's our liaison. He works with the public defender's office, the okay. DA's office, and our courts, and our other partners in justice. And he does this because he's committed to the community. And we appreciate all that you do, Thomas. Um, and we thank you for acknowledging his contributions. Thank you. Uh, Judge, uh, let, let, let me just say, uh, as a member of the Dallas County Juvenile Board and probably the ranking member of the court, of the, of the, of the uh, board, uh, Judge Jenkins and I, uh, two of the nine individuals there, the other are the uh, convening uh, judges of their various disciplines. And the Texas Juvenile Probation Commission requires that we, every institution where we maintain young people in custody, in our care, and in our, under our control, that we take and we must tour those facilities and to make sure that those facilities are in compliance with all the rules and regs. They print us out, checklist, and we are charged with making sure that they're up to par. Well, during COVID, of course, now they allow what <clears throat> are called virtual tours. And so you're at the behest of those individuals 
who show you what they want to show you and you see what you want to see. And I think Mr. Beatty and a few will tell you that, that I've, been, I've left church on Sunday morning and popped up at institutions and said, no, I want to physically see you. I've gone in in the evening and I've gone in and said, I want to physically see you. But guess what, Mr. King has always been there as one of those what I call essentials. He's always, he always seems to be there. Nobody knows, you know, when I'm coming. But I always seem to find Mr. King hovering somewhere around. They don't have time to call him and say he's on the premises. He's there. And so, Mr. King, I, I joined with my, with my fellow um, board members, with the uh, individuals to whom um, we're charged with care, custody, and control, to say thank you. You definitely have demonstrated that you are essential, and uh, just want you to know we appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Congratulations, Mr. Um. I just want to say uh, thanks to you guys for having me here and presenting me uh, with this award. Um, I also want to say thanks to our administration at the juvenile department. They've offered me a lot of freedom to uh, and give me a lot of support, uh, you know, to come up with ideas. And thanks to my team uh, at the juvenile department, my unit, uh, we were able to hash this thing out and we uh, made it work. And I just want to thank you guys for your support. Thank you. You know, it's because of you that our job looks a little easier. So thank you so much for all you right, do, right. and congratulations. Because the good news is, I guess sometimes, that we're not on the front page of the Dallas Morning News. It's because you're too busy taking care of what you've got to take care of and making the juvenile department all that it needs to be for the kids of Dallas County. So thank you. Congratulations and to you too. Please. from the Fire Marshal and Unincorporated Services. Oh, All right. Investigator Walton exemplifies the title of public servant. In her day-to-day -day activities, she is consistent with the application of being helpful and enforcing regulations. Investigator Walton always goes the extra mile to help or explain the issue or how assistance can be attained more often than not. She is advocating to get the citizens the assistance they require through her wide network of contacts rather than just providing the information. Investigator Walton displays tenacity for helping others and insists this become contagious. She will challenge her coworkers to get on board if she perceives they are not of the same level. Investigator Walton recently participated in Dallas County Unincorporated Cleanup event on August the 8th, 2021. The event was designed to allow unincorporated residents a venue to deposit rubbish items, providing a central collection point at no cost. Investigator Walton took the initiative to ensure that residents in the target area received notice going door to door in that target area. Investigator Walton also took the opportunity to make contact with several residents that have been engaged in a corrective action plan to ensure they took advantage of the cleanup event. Investigator Walton had been working with a resident that was in noncompliance in one of the local communities in the unincorporated areas. Investigator Walton, realizing that this 
resident was elderly and the noncompliance was not due to neglect but more ability, took it upon herself to work with the resident and help get the resident assistance in cleaning up in an effort to come into compliance. Walton worked with the residents leading up to the pre-event. It was learned by Walton that the labor assistance offered to the residents had failed to show up. Investigator Walton stepped into action. Investigator Walton was able to work with the residents' neighbors on her own time to remove the rubbish items at the residents' location in preparation for the disposal at the cleanup event. Investigator Walton's action became contagious and the community came together with several residents assisting each other to include the use of a resident's dump truck to tra transport items to the cleanup event. I move adoption of this resolution recognizing Mary Walton as a Dallas County Employee of the Year for law enforcement. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by, say, by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Well, all of Dallas County appreciates you. Chief Williams is over there holding up the wall. We just had, we just, from the Sheriff's Department, we just had this conversation in email uh, because you saved my guys. We, we look at the offsets. And uh, we, we know that on the weekend, in the unincorporated area, it becomes the dumping ground. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we expect to find dead alligators. We, we don't expect nobody to do anything about it. We're we going to find dead horses. We're going to dead livestock. We get that. But boy, it turns in, into, uh, you know, mattress, uh, re I mean, you name it. And that that um, piece that y'all put together for regards to collection, we got to do that more. Yeah, I think did we have to send for some extra stuff because people were everywhere. It, it looked as though the stimulus check had hit and, and uh, everybody was, you know, coming to bring, bring it to Dallas County. But, but it saves my guys a ton of time and energy. And as I told Chief Williams this morning, not only do we have to take and get it off the roadway and all? We got to dispose of it. And so it takes time away. So I, I, I just want to thank you uh, as, uh, as well from Road and Bridge District 3, especially, and from the guys. Thank you, Judge. Commissioners, I'm, I'm humbled by, by this. I just came back from vacation to come back to this wonderful surprise, but I uh, just want to thank you all. And uh, I have a great leadership in my office and um, just want to thank, thank you all again and to all the citizens of Dallas County. Thank you. One more, uh, one more thing I just want to talk about. Mary, she came to us about seven, year, uh, seven years ago. We uh, stole her from Tarrant County. And if I can go over there and steal some more, I'm going to do it. <laughs> but uh, Mary, she's a trailblazer. Just wanted to let y'all know she's a go-getter out there and then incorporated. She's fluent in Spanish, so she communicates with everybody out there. And yes, Commissioner, we're going to have more. Our next one, uh, targeted area is going to be on the north side of this as well. Thank y'all. Well, and um, you know, I just want to mention something. I know that you know I don't have that many unincorporated areas, but Mary, uh, Fire Marshal, your team has been instrumental, not only on the dumping side, but also in the communication side. Uh, a lot of people call our offices asking for, hey, where do I belong to? Am I in the city of Dallas? Which municipality do I belong to? A lot of them don't know they're in an, an un unincorporated area. And just that in itself takes education, takes patience, takes compassion, takes knowledge, takes, you know, the willingness to help these constituents that are in need. And sometimes, like Commissioner Price say, it's just wildlife, it's just animals, dogs that get killed and dumped, and we have, well, I can go on that for a long time, but it's about how the office handles so many issues that are important as a person, as a resident, as a citizen that pays taxes. 
uh, that is important for your team to communicate with us. And uh, I think you have done that in a wonderfully sending us every other month, what are the cases, where are they going, what are you doing, how many hours are spent in which areas you're spending it. That is what we call transparency, that's what we call accountability, and that's what we call excellent work. Mary, congratulations, Fire Marshal. Your team has been doing an exceptional work, and uh, Mary, I hope you had a great vacation. The suntan looks good. <laughs> so, um, Congratulations, felicidades otra vez, gracias. Yeah. Thank you again. Yeah. Congratulations to you, Thank you because so it's the way you do business that really makes a difference. And as I've said before, because you're taking care of, of your business, it makes, it makes our job a lot easier. And so I know that it's teamwork among you, um, but it's still just so much appreciated. And I know you're not done yet, so, uh, <laughs> so we look forward to seeing what comes up. Thank so you. congratulations and thank you so much. Congratulations again, and thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh my God, we need to see you coming. Ireland, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our elected officials and department heads who participated this year. There are individually boxed treats from Sprinkles Cupcake for those employees who were named Employee of the Month. Please go upstairs and get your goodies um, for your employees. So that's for the elected officials and department heads. Don't forget to grab those goodies. We've got what, Shay, like a hundred and something cupcakes up there? Several dozen. So oh, yeah. Each department has their own bag of individual boxes. If you oh. don't get it, me and Shay are going to be really fat next time y'all see it. Take a look at them. Did you see they've got a seal of Dallas County on them? Really? Yeah, yeah they do. That's, that's impressive. That's impressive. Yeah. As we move into the 2022 program, we want to again congratulate all of our 2021 Employees of the Month and our four Employees of the Year, Alejandro Rodeo, Constituent, uh, services, Rachel Rita, Emergency Management, Thomas King, Juvenile, and Mary Walton, Fire Marshal. One more round of applause for those great folks. You couldn't agenda, do it without you. Our agenda now calls for presentations. Dallas County Health and Human Services has the first presentation. Is that going to be virtually? How does that work? Uh, yes. Hi. Good, Good morning. Good morning. Can you see me? Good morning. Uh, great. Now I have my presentation also. Um, not sure if it's loaded. But is, it, is there somebody that can help us with loading the, the presentation? Anyone? Up oh, there it is. Okay. Um, well, if we could go to the next slide. Um, I did want to point out uh, the committee reviewed uh, all of the metrics last night. Um, although we still are remaining in the orange uh, level of transmission and risk level at this point, uh, the committee really wants to emphasize uh, it's extremely concerned with the situation uh, that we're dealing with uh, with the Omicron variant. Uh, I mean, everything that we've seen is that this is extremely transmissible. Uh, it is, CDC just reported, it is already now the dominant strain uh, in, you know, this is in less than three weeks since the first appearance uh, of the uh, Omicron variant in the U.S. 
you know, contrasting it took like three months for the Delta variant uh, to become the dominant strain. So um, a lot of concern about this. Uh, we are in particular uh, concerned about the impact on our uh, healthcare workforce. Um, you know, I can imagine and some of the um, information coming from other countries with this, that, you know, uh, seeing large number of cases among healthcare work st uh, staff, and uh, where if that's the case, then those uh, people being taken out of work, not being available and, uh, on an already strained system. So it's extremely uh, concerning uh, what we're seeing with this. Um, and uh, so I'll go through some of the other data, uh, but again, we, we are still at orange, but uh, it's a very uh, serious concern where we are. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is uh, the available ICU beds. Uh, again, we've stayed at this lower level uh, throughout. Uh, so, uh, and again, this is also, it's not necessarily all from COVID, uh, but other conditions that normally occupy these beds, but the availability of ICU beds is still uh, very limited. Next slide. Uh, the suspected and confirmed emergency department visits in the last 24 hours. Again, here we're seeing some of that increase in the numbers of uh, visits to the emergency department in the last couple of weeks. Uh, certainly that decline uh, that we saw from uh, September uh, through the uh, you know, early uh, end of October has uh, stopped and we're seeing uh, those numbers uh, starting back to increase in, in the last couple of weeks uh, increasing. Next slide. Uh, these are the confirmed admissions. Uh, again, you see that declines have uh, continued to cease and uh, sort of leveling off, going up and down a little bit. Um, so um, unfortunately not seeing those decl declines that we were seeing. Next slide, please. Uh, the confirmed inpatients, again, uh, staying relatively flat. Uh, you know, it should be of note and one of the concerns, uh, if we get a, a large increase in the number of cases due to Omicron, um, the hospitalizations would be a lagging indicator. Uh, but and there's also, you know, again, still some. Uh, we're still trying to find out the severity of the Omicron. Uh, but if there's extremely large numbers of cases, then even if it's a lower uh, percentage that are severe illness with huge numbers, that can still uh, lead to increased. A numbers of hospitalizations and, and stress on the healthcare system. Uh, next slide is the deaths, um, and again, you know, lagging indicator, uh, but worried about uh, if we see a, a huge surge in the total number of cases that we're starting to see. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are again, you can see uh, Dallas off our dashboard. Dallas County number of cases now at about 303 uh, daily average uh, over the seven day last seven day. Um, uh, average. Uh, next slide. For vaccinations, we're now at about almost 70%, 69% of those five and older that have received at least uh, one dose. Uh, but still, um, let's see, uh, you know, it's about maybe 55, I think, percent of the total population that uh, has is fully uh, protected uh, from the vaccine. So, uh, still a lot more people that need uh, vaccination. Uh, next slide. Um, this shows the trends for Dallas County in terms of uh, number of vaccinations. And, you know, we had a little peak a couple weeks ago, um, went down a little. It's, it's higher than it was, uh, but uh, still a lot uh, more uh, vaccination uh, efforts. Uh, and a lot more people that we need to get vaccinated and also with the booster doses. Um, next slide. So again, it's about 1.7 million that have uh, received at least one dose in Dallas County, about 1.4 uh, million full of fully vaccinated and about 356,000 uh, uh, that have received uh, their booster dose. Next slide. Uh, this continues to be uh, you know, largely the hospitalizations and deaths uh, and severe illness, largely among uh, those that are unvaccinated. And, um, uh, you know, we've talked about that there can still be uh, breakthrough cases in persons who are vaccinated and even fully vaccinated, uh, but the severe illness, the hospitalizations and deaths are very well protected 
uh, by vaccination and by the booster. Um, so there is still much, uh, you know, it, this is still very preventable. Um, and, you know, again, we continue to see that in the data for the hospitalizations and deaths. Next slide. As I mentioned, you know, the Omicron variant, this is, you know, just in the last few weeks, um, uh, the, you know, the first uh, U.S. case confirmed December 1st, and we're less than three weeks from that now, and it's already become the dominant uh, strain in the U.S. Uh, and I think we have some local data that's starting to indicate that also. Uh, next slide, please. And here is now uh, the latest CDC map that shows all the states where it's been uh, confirmed, and it's almost every state now. Next slide. Um, uh, again, you know, the questions, how easily does it spread? Everything that we've seen uh, thus far is that it's extremely easily spread. I mean, it's very scary how uh, rapidly this is spreading, um, and even more so than the Delta. Uh, you know, will it cause more severe illness? Uh, we are still looking at uh, that information. Uh, and But even if that's not the case, if we get uh, huge numbers of uh, volumes of cases, uh, then it's, it can overwhelm our healthcare system. Uh, and then also, again, the impact on the healthcare workforce is extremely concerning. Uh, the vaccines, uh, you know, some new data even just came out yesterday, I think, in the Moderna, uh, supporting also that uh, the booster with Moderna, booster with Pfizer's are effective against uh, Omicron. Uh, the vaccines are still, again, very protective and uh, effective about uh, severe illness and hospitalizations and death. Uh, so the vaccines are extremely important as we're dealing with this. And then treatments, uh, still looking uh, to see the effectiveness of some of the existing treatments uh, against Omicron. Uh, next Do slide. Do Dr. Wong, before yeah. you, before you yes. proceed, let me ask you this. Um, may maybe the public's not having any difficulty, and maybe the public is just kind of callousized. But the messaging, when I hear from Dr. Chain over at Parkland, when I hear from the hospital council, I mean, at some point in time, are we going to have a kind of a one clear, concise messaging in terms of how we're filtering this? Because according to Dr. Chain, while we're seeing hospitalization going up, we, you know, apparently he, he, he's what that we're, we're waiting for the kind of, I guess, after the holiday, and it sounds like, you know, that's where the surge is going to be. And maybe, you know, and so I'm just, you know, I know when you, you present here, we try to read all of this, and then we, we look at reports, talk about two or three times more um, infectious, and how many more people doing it, and... I, yeah, I, and, and I say that, you know, there's a lot of information out there. The consistent message that I think underlies all of this is we need to not let our guard down. The situation is still very concerning and, you know, and it's, it's a serious threat. We can't just say, oh, we, uh, you can just go back to normal and that people need to get the vaccine, get boosters and continue to practice the other preventive measures, whether it's masking, whether it's uh, trying to avoid crowds, uh, you know, uh, physically distance and really assess your own risk. Everyone needs to be very conscious, uh, you know, especially um, if you have family members that are uh, vulnerable, whether, you know, parents, grandparents or, or persons in the family that may not be eligible for the vaccine, uh, you know, to take those into consideration as you make any decisions about what you're going to do. Um, so, I, I mean, the, there's a lot of uh, information out there, and I know it can be overwhelming, but the messages are the same. Get vaccinated, get your booster, uh, wear the mask, uh, you know, avoid crowds and try to be as safe as you can. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and the only reason I bring it up is because I never see, um, I guess, John Peter Smith in terms of, you know, making a statement, and that's fine. I, I get it, Parkland and Dr. Chang, and I, I appreciate him, and he does well. But they always seem to speak with, with one voice. I, I see the same guy speaking with one voice, saying this is the way Tarrant County, and of course the others that you don't ever hear from, but I mean the two large counties in the region, I, I see one voice, and I, I guess I just don't ever see that, I don't, I don't see that with Dallas County. Try and getting a PIO. Major pardon? We might want to consider having a PIO so that we can speak with one voice. 
Well, they ain't going to do it with us. You no, know, we got one voice. The health, the health director, you know, and across this country, primarily when I, when I view as community college at 3 o'clock in the morning, I got, I got a health director speaking to it. I don't need a PIO doing it. I mean, I understand the president having, but I don't, I don't need no public information. I just need to synthesize this in such a way that, as he said, the, the message is probably going to continue to be the same. What did they say? 90% of the people are unvaccinated. I got that. It's drilled in. I think, again, I think we've heard most of this to the point that we're callousized. And, and, and I, I don't know if there's any new innovative ways, but all I'm telling you is, is that when I see Tarrant, I, I see one voice. I see that health director speaking. I don't see the hospital council speaking over there. I don't see John Peter Smith speaking over there. I see the health director. And so that's, that's all I'm saying. I just, just, we just the, the message ought to be more synchronized. I, if, if, yeah, that's all. Um, sure, again, you, we know that there's a lot of information uh, out there, but we will try to continue to, uh, I mean, I think the messages are uh, consistent. I, I do want to also em emphasize one other thing, uh, that the testing is another tool that we have uh, for addressing this and slowing down the spread. Uh, we've been, you know, looking and, and you see, uh, you know, more demand for the testing. Uh, I've talked to the local pharmacies uh, consistently. They say uh, they are uh, ordering additional tests of the home tests. Uh, you know, there may be short term uh, runs on it that they, but they're getting these supplies fulfilled and, and um, uh, refilled, you know, in the next day or day after that. Uh, so they are saying they are working on making sure that those home test uh, supplies are readily available. Uh, I spoke to Dr. May with Dallas Cal College, uh, and they have, they have been doing uh, the drive-through testing. Uh, it's been uh, at Mountain View and at Richland. Um, from I think 7:30 in the morning till six, uh, they had scheduled uh, to go through this Thursday and then just continue. And that was based on you know the demand had gone down, but in anticipation of continued demand, they have uh, assured uh, that they will now uh, uh, offer uh, the tests uh, and that drive-through testing um, at um, at those sites uh, through the month of uh, January and then reassess. And they are also going to add it uh, the service to North Lake campus. Uh, we are also working with some of our other uh, community partners and, and, and other private sector partners on offering more testing available. And Parkland is also looking at uh, the resources that they have uh, to expand uh, testing and, and, and possibly uh, make available some uh, more rapid tests. Uh, the other thing the president just announced, you know, 500 million of the home test kits that will be available to be ordered, I think, online starting in January. Uh, so um, just did not want to not mention the testing aspect of it. Uh, you know, some of the, as people are looking at the holidays and how to prepare for that, one of, another tool is to, um, uh, to do a rapid test right before that uh, and, uh, you know, check the status. And certainly continue to monitor people for symptoms and not attend any events or things like that. But the test is another uh, tool to help and, with that. And while you bring up that 500,000 uh, testing, you know, that online ordering, all of that sounds good. You, we still forget, you know, broadband and what's happening in, in poor communities and access is just not there. We, we, we almost have to go to a, hopefully a second tier of some kind of distribution. And again, I don't know if it's going to portal through you or whom, but we always, whenever we say things like that, whether it's you know, well, well, we'll do telehealth, we'll do broadband, I mean, uh, um, we'll, we'll have online orders. I just always have a, a backup plan. Sure. And, and again, uh, we're really uh, appreciative with the partnership with a lot of the other community partners. Dallas College has been doing great. We're, uh, they've got it at uh, drive through Mountain View and Richland and then uh, now this other uh, site and then um, uh, Parkland. Again, looking at expanding that. Uh, so we and and uh, one of our private partners, Gene IQ, has also been uh, offering to do uh, pop-up site testing, so we can take some more. There are other sites that uh, can support that. We can work with them uh, to make the testing available too.
Could I ask a question about the, in, the influenza update? Yes. Um, how does that compare with the flu status this time last year? Well, last year, you know, was extremely low. Uh, at this point, well, two years uh, we ago. are still, uh, our percent positives are uh, very low. I think it's now total about 1.6% of the positive tests uh, as of uh, yeah, December 4th. Uh, we are seeing some more uh, influenza A activity. Um, and on the next slide, uh, you can see the hospitalizations are um, still, you know, relatively low. Uh, so we're, we're worried about it. We still want people to get the flu vaccine. Uh, it is not um, as bad as certainly um, many flu seasons we've had thus far. And um, it's it's relatively low at this point. Okay. Um, not maybe not quite as low as last season, uh, but I mean it's still. So compared at this to point, two, three, four years ago, it's it's lower. Oh, it's yeah, it's lower. It's okay, thank lower. you. All right, and then just uh, Dr. Huang, you know, fishing um, out. Yes. Uh -huh. Before you close, you know we know, and you mentioned the holiday season. Uh, uh -huh. We expect more people traveling to edit any countries, other countries, than in the last two years. Any um, advice, any change that you expect coming from the federal government according to this? What would you put in the record for those people thinking about traveling overseas? Um, you know, I think check the uh, requirements and uh, for any country that you're looking at visiting and, and uh, you know, some of them require specific testing or quarantine requirements and things like that. So uh, certainly understand that those are uh, things that are um, and restrictions, other restrictions that may be out there. Um, you know, bottom line, uh, probably if, if you are not vaccinated, you shouldn't travel is the, you know, uh, best recommendation. Uh, there's still all the requirements for on the planes and in the uh, airports and transportation hubs that you have to wear the mask and, and, and do things. But, um, uh, you know, it's hard to say um, exactly what if there will be other federal uh, restrictions or what the other countries are doing. But, you know, absolutely check uh, what those requirements are for particular countries. Thank you, Dr. Huang. Wish you a happy holiday season. You too. Thank you. And, and I'm next, I do have a couple of things, uh, that, and I'm going to send this letter uh, to all the commissioners' court. Uh, but I wanted to read this. I received this this morning a little after 9, um, and the, the letter reads as follows. It's from the, the Public Health Committee. Uh, Dear Judge Jenkins, the Public Health Committee met yesterday to discuss the Dallas County metrics and the changing situation associated with the emergence of the Omicron variant. Our review demonstrated a dramatic increase in the number of COVID-19 cases in Dallas in the past week. We do also know that we have clusters of COVID-19 associated with social events, but Dallas has not seen an increase in serious COVID-19 related illness or profound impact on the healthcare system yet. At this point, Dallas County is also seeing, number one, an increase in the percent positivity among tested individuals which is an early sign of a new wave. Number two, an increase in the use of emergency rooms for COVID-19-like symptoms, which is another early indicator of an impending wave. Number three, increasing reports of inadequate testing facilities and access through the community. It appears that the healthcare facilities do have adequate supplies, but not the grocery store. Number four, increased reports of staffing challenges in acute care and long-term care facilities. We also know that despite the efforts of the healthcare and public health communities, a vaccination rate of fully vaccinated people remain around 50%, with only 30% of the individuals having received a booster. At this point, the committee did not move from the orange risk level to red. However, this does not mean we are not very concerned about the current situation, and we want to reiterate to you and the commissioners how concerned we are about the potential impact of Omicron on the population of the economy of Dallas. We are very concerned and want to emphasize the importance and need for you and the, and the commissioner's leadership and help in, number one, increasing the vaccination rate in Dallas County residents. We must get our population vaccinated and boosted. 
Number two, enhancing testing capacity and access to testing to help our residents identify cases so that the affected can isolate and prevent further uh, transmission. And by the way, uh, yesterday, uh, our emergency management department requested 5,000 uh, test kits. Um, number three, reinforcing and using tools available to them to implement masking and physical distancing in public areas. Number four, limiting the size of public gatherings to allow for physical distancing. Number five, encouraging the use of masking, physical distancing, and vaccination together to combat this current variant. We do plan on adding some additional metrics to follow the new wave as we are worried about the impact on healthcare facility staffing. We think this will be our biggest challenge. We understand that everyone is tired of the pandemic and wants to get back to normal and celebrate. We want to encourage these celebrations and think with the new tools we have and what we know works, we can do this. We will just need to substitute some behaviors to enhance the safety of our residents Happy and safe holidays, and that's from the Public Health Committee. I want to uh, point out uh, two things that the CDC is talking about for the holidays that are going to be easy for us to do here in Texas, because today the high is 62. On Christmas and, and Christmas Eve, the high is 81 and 80, respectively. To the extent that you can take any part of a celebration outside, that is strongly encouraged by the CDC guidance uh, that came out after Omicron. To the extent that you can't do that for some reason, it's strongly encouraged that you open uh, windows or doors to allow more uh, ventilation to come through. So that if you have a person who is asymptomatic um, for Omicron, either because they're never going to have symptoms or because they just hadn't started having their symptoms yet. Uh, we get that cross ventilation going, which is ideally outside, but secondarily inside with windows or doors cracked, uh, so that there's less chance of spread. Why is that important? Why is the CDC pushing that? Remember early on in the pandemic when they were defining close contact, it's still the same definition. But a close contact is a person that you've been in uh, within six feet of for a cumulative total of, of well, with Omicron probably less, but in the old days, 15 minutes um, with the less spreading alpha variant. So it's, it's about dosage. If you, if you go past a person on the Katy Trail or the White Rock Lake while you're both breathing heavy and exercising, that person breathes a little bit on you, you breathe a little bit on that person because you're going in opposite directions, you're unlikely to get sick. But if you're in a contained room with a person for an extended period of time and they're sick with COVID, you're very likely uh, to get COVID. And with Omicron, unfortunately, that's going to be true for the vaccinated who haven't been boosted for at least a month. Um, so it's something that we got to uh, look for. Um, it, it's, you may remember Cowboys fans, you may remember this. There was one young man, one young athlete uh, with the Washington Redskins, who was a defensive end who chose not to be vaccinated. That's right, Washington football team, beg your pardon. Um, with the Washington football uh, club that chose not to be vaccinated. He got COVID. He went into a position room where they watched film with other young men, all of whom had chosen to be vaccinated and boosted. All those young men got sick because that dosing was so high. You know, he, of course, the young, the young man that didn't get vaccinated, the first one to get sick, he didn't know he was sick. He didn't know he was giving his uh, teammates COVID. But there was enough dosing, enough breathing in there for them all to get sick. And as a result, they had to play two players at defensive end uh, that day who together, I think, had like five NFL snaps or something uh, before that day. Um, so we you know, really want to encourage you as we get together, because what's going to happen is at the holidays, families get together. So that cross ventilation really helps taking it outside. If you take it outside, you don't need to wear the mask any. If you're inside after you eat, the CDC is recommending that we do wear a mask. And it's a pain in the, in the behind to have to wear these masks, right? 
But as I was telling my, my 89 year old mama yesterday, because she was talking about wanting to do all these things, and I said, well, you know, everything's a risk, and pick the ones you want to do, and let's do them as safely as, as possible. Because even if Omicron is less serious, we don't know it, but we hope it, that it's, that it's the symptom wise, it's not quite as bad as Delta. But if we get three times as many people sick at one time as we did with Delta, and it's mild, some of the folks, it's just a numbers game, some of the folks are going to unfortunately have more severe problems. They're going to end up being hospitalized. Some of those folks are going to be on the ventilator. Some of those folks aren't going to get, you know, aren't going to make it. So if we can do those smart things in that CDC, you know, holiday guide, that don't, it doesn't ruin your holidays. You can still have your cousins over to your house. You just open the windows or better still going outside. When you're eating, if you're all eating at tables, try to eat at the table with the people that you live with and they eat at the table with the people they live with. And then you all get back together to open presents with the mask back on, unfortunately, because we want to keep you safe. So that's all I've got today on that. Commissioner Price, you got a presentation? I'm going to let the holiday pass. <clears throat> okay, I'm oh, sorry, Commissioner Daniel. Uh, or, or, go ahead. If you no, no. Uh, she, she got... Didn't see it. Uh, yeah, Commissioner Daniel. Yeah, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry, Commissioner Daniel. At this time, I'd like to uh, present uh, Ms. Jolie Robinson, who, <clears throat> who is the CEO of uh, MDHA, who has been very instrumental in addressing um, housing homelessness, the impact of COVID on all of our populations and, our, and the public nature of housing and homelessness. Um, there has been the special um, tasks with the uh, Dallas Real-Time Rapid Rehousing, and so I'm particularly proud to uh, have her provide an update of where we are on what they call the DRTRR. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Commissioner Daniel, and hello to all of our commissioners. I am um, the new president and CEO at Metro Dallas Homeless Alliance. Commissioner Daniel and I have known each other for years, actually, so awesome to be able to work alongside her in this new space. Um, and, and all of the conversations that we've had here today, we've also had to think about with our population that's experiencing homelessness. So we've worked um, alongside our county partners. Thank you to Dr. Wong, thank you to Parkland as well, as we come together to really support our shelters as they're having to have and, and create and sustain more um, creative ways to think about COVID isolation for those that are unhoused that maybe show up on their shelter doors. Um, for testing, um, even when we think about inclement weather, the potential of inclement weather coming up, even for testing around COVID. So thank you. Um, before I get into the presentation, I just want to say a huge thank you to the Homeless Collaborative of Dallas and Collin County, all of the partner agencies that work alongside MDHA in this space to make the experience of homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. And I think we have a PowerPoint presentation that we'll be providing as well. When I get the opportunity to come back and speak to you all, I'm also gonna be um, leading with stories because I think stories are important and some of the stories you won't hear today have been some of the individuals and families that we've been able to house over the past few months through the rapid rehousing uh, work, the Dallas Real-Time Rapid Rehousing work, um, including a partnership we have with Downtown Dallas Inc. and SPCA to even house and care for those that are unhoused and have pets. Um, and so we're looking forward to the continuation of that work into 2022. Again, I mentioned a huge thank you to the county partnership, um, including Dr. Wong, as we um, think about the planning and move through the planning for not only um, COVID, uh, continuation of COVID isolation, but inclement weather as well. Next slide. As you see on the presentation there, um, our mission statement is outlined. We are a backbone organization, really an organization focused on collective impact. We have 100 plus um, organizations that work alongside us that are focused on um, housing, our unsheltered residents. Um, it's a combination of public, private, and nonprofit institutions. And if there's nothing else that, that you remember from today, it's all in an effort to make the experience of homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. Next slide. 
many of our goals have been outlined, and these are goals not sitting in um, kind of ivory tower, if you will, but really working alongside our community partners. When we think about, um, and, and you'll see the term homeless collaborative, those are our community partners, 100 plus. When we think about the three goals that we have outlined effectively in the ending veterans homelessness, Commissioner Price, you asked a question previously, that's about 300 veterans in, in, that we're serving that are in our system that, that we're looking to um, effectively end veterans homelessness for. With that, that means really, as we've seen, unprecedented dollars and, and systems come into this, next slide after that one. Um, as we've seen unprecedented dollars come into this space, not only the support of the county, but the ARPA funds that have come from the federal government, um, it really is uh, forcing us and, and really um, providing the wind beneath our wings, really, to get us to move quickly to, to rehouse over, uh, we, we have a number, a target, and you'll see those goals that, that are outlined. But really effectively ending, ending homelessness um, for our veterans. Um, we, we are not going to quite reach that goal by the end of 2021 as we're right here the week of Christmas, but it looks like the early part of 2022. And that effective end means that there's a, a pipeline. Those that are in the system are being rehoused at a rapid rate. So that's what effectively ending homelessness, and we continue to talk about it. It's, it's those are coming into the system. They're not being trapped in the system. There's not a bottleneck process but they're moving through the system. Yes, sir. How, how can that, Jolene, thank you, and, and you're right, we've gone through this, but I appreciate the presentation this morning. Mm -hmm. How connected are you to uh, our uh, Veterans Service Office here in regards to Dallas County? And that, that's the reason I asked the question, okay. because I charge him oftentimes with, uh, you know, kind of where are the homeless veterans, and I keep hearing that, kind of anecdotally. So the fact that you've now put as you said, unsheltered, about 300 on it, veterans. Yes, sir. H how connected, uh, and by the way, this is our director of... Uh, Hello, director. Yeah. I would love to be more connected, okay. so I'll be sure to, to make yeah. that connection. And, and, and I appreciate Dr. Wong, all of them, and all they have to do, but, you know, in a lot of places, this stuff is kind of specialized, and, and, and while they're looking at the, you know, 100,000 foot level, he's concerned primarily from this court his directive is to deal with veterans, whether it's, okay. you know, the veterans court, mm -hmm. you know, we're asking what they're doing, but we're also asking what, what he's doing. Okay, okay, good deal. Then I'll be sure to, to make Henderson. that connection. Mr. Henderson, yes. Right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, you see the, the homeless collaborative goal for 2023 and then 2025 is a reduction in family and youth homelessness. As many of you all are aware, and I saw to Dr. Hinojosa earlier, youth homelessness is um, one of those things we're looking to tackle as a system. Um, even in working with our DISD partners and other nonprofits that are purely focused on, on serving our youth. Okay, I hate to jump in here again, but see, DISD will admit it. Problem I got is I got some cities in my district who won't admit that they've got a youth, homo, homeless, unsheltered, I'm right. sorry, yes. a youth, unsheltered problem. Mm -hmm. And are you having that challenge, especially, I'll just say, to the East? <laughs> I won't give a direction, but okay. I think it's a challenge for us as a system just to be honest about our youth that are experiencing homelessness um, because there's gaps perhaps in service that we have to dig a bit more into. Um, so for me, coming into this space, it's really understanding all of those service providers that are doing the work and where we continue to see those gaps. So we've had some very um, involved youth advocates that continue to keep it at the forefront of our minds. Um, it's one of the things that I have been involved in, um, even working with Outlast Youth and Commissioner Daniel some years back. Um, about focusing on our youth and especially our LGBTQ plus youth that seem to be highest in those numbers of youth experiencing homelessness. Next slide, thank you. Um, updates on our strategic initiatives. As you know, Dallas Real-Time Rapid Rehousing is a sliver of kind of the work that we do across the system, but it is like the most impactful thing that perhaps is happening at this moment. Veterans housing surge, and of course, I'm going to get in touch with you as well so we can continue to uplift that and focus on our, our veterans housing. We've had our lease up events that, that have happened. We've had a tremendous partnership with um, the Dallas Public Library downtown. 
um, to host some of those those veterans lease up events all in the same room you can meet with a case manager and through all of this we are focused on um, you know adequate COVID protocols as well so you you have to mask up you know if there's any testing that needs to happen as well for our service providers that are in the space those that are attending you're able to meet with a housing locator a case manager all in the same span of a couple of hours and then we have um, housing locators that have found units and we're getting people placed into homes and leases signed and everything in, in that space. When I get to the end of the presentation, I'll kind of, there's also a call to action that I continue to have, not only for our commissioners, but those that are listening today in the virtual space um, or those in the audience about continuing to help us find um, available units, not only for our veterans, but for, for any individual that's unhoused. The, the efforts of Dallas Real Time can only be as successful as we have available units to place individuals. And as we know, the cost of, of apartment and rent um, are continuing to go up, so we don't want that to be an impediment to us finding available units for individuals. Data is critically important, just as it is to the county. It is to the entirety of our system. So you see on the slide, there's a data warehouse implementation that um, helps us continue to get the right data in our system so that we are ensuring that we have the right interventions and that the right interventions are working in a way, um, if we look at the last point in time count and traditionally, the number one population that seems to be experiencing um, unprecedented homelessness throughout year after year are black males. So that data warehouse implementation also helps us be accountable when it comes to racial equity in our system to ensure that if black males are coming into the, the homeless system at higher rates, that they're also getting housed quicker, the interventions that are happening for them are ones that are customized to meet those, those specific needs. We do have a 2022 point in time count that is happening. The CEO, Nissi New, who's in the audience, she does amazing work at Metro Dallas Homeless Alliance. She's in charge of the work of, of getting that 2022 point in time count up and running for us as we go out and there'll be a slide that talks a little bit more about that. And community awareness and advocacy is one space that I'll be leaning into as well. We already do that now, but we'll be leaning into that in 2022. Next slide, thank you. So here you'll see just the, the information about the Dallas real-time rapid rehousing. We know that we haven't, this is kind of our first um, opportunity to talk to the commissioners about the effort and the initiative. Our, our um, huge Herculean goal is to rehouse 2,762 plus individuals over a span of two years. That means by the end of 2023, we've seen all of those individuals housed. Um, and the data, of course, is actually is, is critically important to, to ensure that we get there. The funding, as I mentioned, the unprecedented funding, not only from the ARPA funds, the federal funds, but our county dollars. So thank you to our county commissioners for, for really um, investing in this initiative to make that happen. And then um, there's a targeted encampment strategy. We're working alongside City of Dallas Office of Homeless Solutions. They're leading in that space. We're there as support to be sure that we're doing, it's, it's a six week process to ensure that we're going out to sites, we're doing effective community outreach, we're letting people know that there's, there's you know, units available, um, that there's services available as well as the partnership we have with SPCA has come in handy de during those encampment decommissioning, that decommissioning work. And Next while we're on this space right now too, I wanted to mention that I often get the question, what is Dallas County doing? Mm -hmm. Um, and at this particular point in time in history, the partnership between Dallas County with $23 million of ARP funds plus another $2 million in vouchers, working with the city of Dallas with their $25 million, as well as the mm -hmm. $10 million coming from United Way partnership with many of their people, mm -hmm. as well as, I think there, there are at least two other cities, is it Mesquite and... Next, next slide also outlines what your, Garland is a part of that, Plano oh. I believe is a part of that. The, the next slide talks specifically about what there you're referring you to as well, right? The um, amazing partnership and kind of being able to step up and stand in this space from the county, from Dallas County, so thank you. Um, we can't do all that we do without financial dollars. And it's that partnership of maximizing and, 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 and really uh, leveraging 
all of our resources in order to achieve the great things mm -hmm. that you're looking at here. Absolutely. And all of that, I'm sorry, were you best? Oh, I was just going to have a, a question regarding the practical, and it may bleed a little bit yeah. into the philosophical on this. So, um, 2,700 individuals, right? Um, it, it, would, it would make sense, of course, to tackle the easiest to take care of cases, right? And, and probably on the other side of that spectrum from the easy, you know, so you have your, uh, you know, former felons, right? The invisible prison type stuff, you know, that they, they can be sustained once, once they get a chance to get that escape velocity. Co-occurring mental health and addiction issues, that's gonna be my stickiest population, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, not a criticism, but you know, these people in large part are not gonna be a majority of that 2,700 in all likelihood. How do you balance that? You know, how do you, how do you, um, you know, make sure that you're, you're finding ways um, but you know, building better systems so when you know my population is 10,000, I've now cut it down to 5,000, I can go work on the harder cases, it's gonna take a lot more of the wraparound services. Um, so how, how do you kind of make that transition? And I, and I talk about it with an eye to how do, how do we make this ARP funds really get our bang for our buck? Yeah. Like not, not just getting the 2,700, but we build good systems yeah. so that you know when the, the ARP funds are gone, the system's really good at getting people help for who's left in that population? Yeah, great, really great question. So there's already organizations that are at the table talking about what future state could look like for perhaps our hardest to keep housed or our hardest to, if it, if it does have to involve, if it does involve like extreme mental health issues. So Meadows is in the same room where we have a Metro Care partnership as well that we've had for years. And we're having those conversations. So what does it look like to get folks, if, if phase one is real time rapid rehousing, what does it look like with an eye to the future of digging into the, that, that perhaps um, most, uh, like the word you said, the sticky, the sticky population that probably needs the most resources to kind of get their feet under them or being honest about some people will probably always need some sort of case management and wraparound services. So it, the conversation is being had with all those agencies that um, already serve in that space about what that could potentially look like, but also bringing in and talking to folks from across not only our state, but country about what are best practices in other parts of our country that we can implement in a space like this. The real-time rapid rehousing work is is yes, housing 2,700 people, but it's also having us operate differently. Look at how our operations is currently going. Everyone is coming to the table when it comes to our community partners that's working alongside us. Those that have been in this space for years to think about how our system is working and can continue to work more effectively for those that need it best. So to your point, the ARPA funds, even if they, um, once they go away, we do have a system using da Dallas um, real-time rapid rehousing. We have a system that has gone through a process of working better together, right? I think one of the things too that you're referring to here is that, uh, you know, referring back also to what you had to say, Commissioner Koch, in the respect that we are using the funding that we have that had not been available um, before from the federal government but then with the attitude that we're addressing problems today with the thought in mind of how we can develop a better foundation, mm -hmm. a better system, so that 10 years from now we will be in a better place. Absolutely. And so that's where I'm particularly appreciative of the attitudes that you bring to the table, mm -hmm. what MDHA is doing, and then, you know, working with, I know what, what our HHS department is doing in, in, in putting together those um, healthcare systems mm -hmm. that are good not only for COVID and for the housing situation today, but can be applied to the other types of healthcare situ issues that a large metropolitan county will have. Mm -hmm. So I know that that's kind of where your Absolutely. mind and heart are. Yeah and your action. Yeah, so, um, and, you know, I, was, I grew up in the South and we say you don't, this is not a moment to slap lipstick on a pig, right? This is a moment to really look at revamping a system so that it works best for those that are entering into the system. Even looking, peeling back and going a little bit farther upstream and looking at diversion techniques so that we're, pre we're preventing people from continuing mm -hmm. to be in the system. 
So, and just one follow up on that. So, who on the team and what or you know, what individuals or what organizations are going to be held accountable for selecting the metrics mm -hmm. and then actually doing the measuring, holding people accountable to those those measurements? Everyone comes together for that, but the federal government definitely holds us accountable. Okay. We are also accountable with a community dashboard that you'll see a mock-up that the public can hold us accountable. Our elected officials are holding us accountable. We're also holding ourselves accountable. To the point that was made earlier, it's about, it's about looking at the system and how are we um, how are we modifying the system so that it works better? It's even organizationally. How are we looking at what people are doing, where they're assigned, what they're focused on? If we know we need to focus on landlord engagement, we're already building a team and have job posting. That's a shameless plug. We're hiring right now, if anyone is interested in, in joining Metro Dallas Homeless Alliance. But we're looking at that type of infrastructure and capacity building so that we are working, we're working better. Next slide. That's just the kind of tranches of how the funds will be utilized. If you haven't seen that, um, the federal subsidies, how that's, how that's going to be utilized, the rental, um, the, the emergency housing vouchers, some of the services, because it, we, are, we do really advocate for housing first, but that does not mean there's not going to be case, robust case management um, to keep people housed and navigating systems that they might need to if it is the um, someone just retired. And I just turned 40, so to hear folks worked at the county for 40 years is blowing my mind today, <laughs> but kudos to them. Um, you know, when it comes to the expungement, you know, processes that are happening, how are case managers working alongside people if it's necessary to make that happen for them as well? And then as I mentioned before, the landlord engagement work is absolutely critical in this space because we want not just folks in the system, but we have to have units to place individuals. It's not just enough That's to- That's my point. Mm -hmm. uh, my point is, you know, at the end of the day, you can have all the money in the world. There's no inventory, mm -hmm. and, and this is a hot market. And that whole landlord engagement thing, just watching my, my JP courts, I mean, while they know, you know, that, that they have access to, to the resources, it's still, I mean, talk about landlord engagement. <laughs> it, 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 I think the challenge I heard a few minutes ago was, how do you do this, this whole tenant this whole tenant engagement? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, do you do, how do you do that? So, I mean, we're also in the space of, of leaning and talking to our apartment association partners, right? Like talking to everyone, bringing everyone at the table. The, the conversation with the city of Dallas, if you have a list of LIHTC properties, right? So thinking about the tactics, if you have a list of LIHTC properties, could you communicate that to us so that we can engage landlords in that space and think about alongside the apartment association and think about do you have available units and my plug for any uh, any space I'm able to be in is if you know of a landlord or have landlords that you um, are affiliated with or partner with regularly that would be interested and in have available units we would love to talk to them about this opportunity and you see that last um, kind of column there focuses and includes landlord incentives um, that can be included to kind of quote unquote sweeten the pot for the continued engagement and partnership with those with those landlords. The move-in kits are a, a wonderful opportunity and you'll see um, me talk a little bit more about that in the slides coming up. But not only are you getting placed in housing, but there's a box that has towels or dishes or, or utensils to cook, cooking utensils in there. Because it's not just enough to get into a home, you also have all those other things. There's an amazing partnership that we have with um, a furniture company about even supplying and purchasing furniture to get people up. I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is flesh in the game. Yes, sir. One of the things we did here at Dallas County in our housing program years ago, I mean, we require people, you know, regardless of their eligibility, you gotta, you gotta go through the program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there, a, and I, I guess I don't really see that. I, I know it's a difficult population. Yeah. Uh, but uh, how you, I'm back to management of them. Mm -hmm. I can deal with the landlord. The landlord just wants to make sure, for the most part, they're gonna have some consistent. Uh, uh, Revenue stream and less headaches yep. with, with regards to that particular tenant, and so that's what I'm, I'm, I'm looking for. I'm looking like maybe she's got the 
got the answer, but I'm, I'm looking for that piece. Mm. Yeah. Maybe she got the answers. <laughs> yeah, I was going to lean into the, the case managers. That's the reason for the case managers. So when you think of a housing first approach for those experiencing homelessness, there's nothing you have to do that makes you worthy of getting housing. But once you are housed, there is robust case management that gets you there, right, to get you on a path to more self-sustainability. Did you want to add? Okay, okay. So, so that's... To your point, the skin in the game is that, right? Knowing that eventually, as you as 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 you're housed first, your basic need of shelter is taken care of first, that case management really comes full force even prior to that to ensure that your needs are met and that you are also moving through a process of self-sustainability. Because this is not this is not vouchers for a lifetime in this moment, but it is moving those through uh, through a process for safe, safe sustainability. But it also opens up shelters for those that may be harder to reach to have space availability as well. And, and, and I, we all understand that. I, I used to tell people that was the same thing as African Americans transitioned to the fact that the, you know the federal government did not allow them to <clears throat> bridge into ownership and houses, and that's what. Uh, apartments were designed. That's what Section Eight was designed to do. Uh, to be is to be a conduit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is now moved beyond just being a conduit. Absolutely. And so you got generations. Mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to figure out what is it going to take to trigger those individuals who may have been out there a few months, may have been out there a year, mm -hmm. to kind of get into that mindset. Of, I mean, enough case managers to. I, I just, okay. I, just, I mean, we just held a case manager of the year award because they are some amazing folks that operate in the system to walk alongside individuals day in and day out to provide that support and move them to, to, that, to that place of being able to sustain themselves. Well, and how many do you have right now? Knowing what you want to do. And first of all, thank you for being here, Commissioner Daniels. Thank you for this presentation. I think I've been, we've been working with homelessness since 2001, the mm -hmm. first time that we had people like Tom Donning and Mayor Rawlings before he was mayor, you know, sharing these efforts. And I think looking at the presentation, we have the best shot we have had in many, many years. Absolutely. Right now. Not only because communication and partnerships have grown bigger, because I think also we have understand the importance mm -hmm. you know, of, you know, of a healthy city helping the homeless. Mm -hmm. um, I think that all the programs that we have put together are fabulous programs. I think they are communicating better than ever, in my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. However, we still have the challenge of the market, like Commissioner Pratt said, the, the amount of units, the fact that we have to go to the landlords and say, hey, if you have any uh, units, we help you, we give you a bonus, I mean, a thousand dollars, just guarantee me 12 months. Mm -hmm. I think that is, it's good that we have that, but at the same time, it's 12 months, you have it back. Mm -hmm. So how many case managers, not to mention that this pandemic have brought a lot of mental issues, a lot of, um, you know, distrust, about government, about help, especially in a lot of the communities of color. Mm -hmm. So how many case managers do we have based on our goals? Mm -hmm. How many of them are bilingual? I think the partnership with the churches, the partnership with the cities, the counties, and all the information that you have here, the bonuses for the apartment association and landlords is great. But do we have the case managers to help all these people? Because really, you're going to have to take them by the hand. Absolutely. Other than that, I think it will be very difficult that some of them will get into a website and sign themselves in. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. Not gonna it hasn't happen. happened. It's not going to happen. So what are we doing to cross this gap? How many case managers, how many of them are not only speaking Spanish, speaking multi-languages uh, do we have? And how does this fit into our goal? I'm sorry, she's giving me information. So we have about 100 case managers right now in the system. Part of these, part of the unprecedented funds that came in have allowed people to build capacity in the case management space. 
Um, the, the number of bilingual, I, I don't have offhand, but yes, folks are hiring um, folks are hiring in a way that individuals look like the communities that they're they're serving, in, including language. Um, I, there was another thought I had that I just forgot to, that I wanted to share with you, but hopefully it'll come back. So we understand that if we are looking at housing 2,700 folks in this time frame, that is the infrastructure that we're talking about that takes that takes a little bit of time to get there and, and have on site. So case management is one of them. The, the other thing that we are thinking, diff, not differently, but creatively about is also partnerships with our area colleges so that we're bringing more people into this social services space. We know that employee employment and, and job searches are happening um, now and some jobs are going unfulfilled. Even when we talk to our community partners about filling some of the positions we have um, or they have at their agencies, how are we lifting those up? Because we can have, and many of our agencies have job postings and positions, but we are also fighting against um, the larger job market and getting some of those positions filled. But at the moment, there's about 100 of those case managers. Can I ask you a question about that? Mm -hmm. Are those ones that MDHA hires, or is it because of the partnership with so many agencies? Absolutely. It's the partnership with the agencies. So the bridge, um, um, who, City Square, yeah, it's 16 different organizations okay. that. Okay, yeah. because, you know, constituents are contacting us where they get this, this form to fill out. If they can download it, that's mm -hmm. one thing. Mm -hmm. And second of all, many of them say, I don't know how to fill this out even if I did get it. Where mm -hmm. do I go for help? So can, uh, are you? I'll follow up. I'm, I'm, MDHA I'm, okay. then might be the, 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 the portal Absolutely. by which that could be accomplished? Okay, we'll be sure to follow with Aaron okay. and, and you about, Great. about Thank the you Yeah, very but much. just like that, Commissioner, downloading a form, really? I mean, where? Exactly. Well, that's what we, we were working yeah, and yesterday I'm, with the guy. Our outreach said, and case management probably wouldn't do, do that, well, so I, I wanted to follow just to be sure. If you have 100 case managers, that's mm -hmm. one case manager for 27 people. Understood. That's a, but your case, everybody's on a different spectrum of their needs. So every case manager, 27 people are not needing every day, 27, their full hour capacity of a case manager, right? Well, so, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. The, I mean, if you give me the yeah. case load and if you give me how many cases based on what, mm -hmm. then that will help me understand better how many case managers do you need. Mm -hmm. But right now, by the numbers that you have given me, I only know that each of them have 27 people, and I don't know, like you say, at what level of need they are. Mm -hmm. If I need to go to their houses, if they have a computer, if they have someone to help them, do they need mental health? Do they need uh, family therapy? Do they need a, where to live? Do they have the house and they need the help? I, I mean, just looking at the variables and the, pos and the probabilities, yeah. I can go crazy. So I hope that you can you know, give us a little bit more information on this mm -hmm. so we can help you. Mm -hmm. And obviously with the American Rescue Plan funds, probably we will know how to target the areas that need it the most, the zip codes that need it the most, Absolutely. how many people, if 27 is too many or not enough. Okay. Absolutely. And we'll follow up about the form because usually that's not, the, the ask is not for people experiencing homelessness to go and fill out a form oh, themselves. Okay. So we'll be sure to, to follow up about that. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. Next slide. It's just a, a timeline and overview, um, rehousing 360 families and survivors of domestic violence, those emergency housing vouchers to make that happen uh, quickly, and then rehousing 2,000 unsheltered individuals and 300 sheltered individuals by the end of that September 2023 deadline. Next slide. Here's the public uh, dashboard mock-up. It exists on the Metro Dallas Homeless Alliance. You can take a look at things based on an intervention, wh whether it's um, real-time rapid rehousing, um, if, you can, if you want to take a look at that, or emergency housing vouchers. It's also broken down by race and ethnicity and household type so that we are, again, with the racial equity lens, looking at those that are being served um, through the system. Next slide. Again, just another mock-up about uh, the variation of the intervention you can drill down into and look at how those placements are um, and the demographic breakdown and, again, the racial equity of housing assessments and referrals. This type of reporting helps us 
um, identify if there's a chink, uh, 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 is it a link in the chain, so whatever the phrase is. <laughs> when there's a chain, uh, when there's a little bit of a chain broken when the process, this kind of data and information helps us dig a bit more into where it might be happening. I'm gonna get into um, some action and how we need help from the larger community. That's our landlord incentive program. If you know of any landlords who are interested, potentially, um, we have an amazing team that we are, that's working now that we're also building into, into our uh, capacity for our organization about landlord engagement. We have a website, that, I mean not a website, an email address that you can email us about. What are we doing to reach out? Because there's a real movement now, rather than forcing uh, consumers and or partners mm -hmm. to come to us, mm -hmm. how do, what are we doing to reach out? Yeah, so that's that landlord engagement uh, team that literally goes to properties um, and talks to landlords on site. Um, it, it, again, as I mentioned before, it's talking to the Apartment Association of Greater Dallas on a, on a higher level to ask, you know, how can we partner with you to show us um, and have us be provided with information from across the county or city or region about um, landlords that might be interested or have available units. So you've got an active uh, Absolutely. recruitment effort going Absolutely. on. Absolutely, outreach and recruitment. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Next slide. There's a the We Come Home campaign. We talked. I talked a little bit about the move-in kits, um, and we have somebody, Hannah Sims, on our team who's doing an amazing job with that. Um, and you'll see some of those items there that uh, we are thinking about when it talks about uh, you know making a house a home for individuals that they may need blankets, hangers. You see all that the kitchen utensils, the household items as well. And so for the public in the virtual space, or those here in the audience, if you have a group or organization that's interested in continuing to partner with us in this space, please do not um, hesitate to reach out to us. Just thirty seconds on this, and that is this is what makes a room. A, a workable situation so that a person can actually live there. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So instead of just you know coming to an empty home, um, you have items that are there and ready for you. Really welcome you home. Data-driven change. We've talked a lot about data. The data warehouse. You can next slide. The data warehouse is one thing that we've already um, that I've already talked a little bit about. But it, it, to the point that was made earlier. Really, this is also an unprecedented time for us to look at the system and is the system working as we need it, it needed to work. And we can't do that without data that is not accurate and is not pulling from a variety of sources. So that data warehouse is really helpful in um, getting us to you know, think about all the data that we have. Is it the right data doing appropriate analysis of that data as well? Next slide is just kind of a picture of what the data warehouse is, everything that's being poured into that system as well, and how it helps us with reporting. The next couple of slides, thank you, go into point in time count. Um, it talks a little bit about, I'm sure most of you have heard about the point in time count, but what it is, why um, it, it talks about, uh, you know, due to COVID, what are we thinking about when it comes to keeping everyone safe? Um, but it is absolutely critical that we have accurate um, counting of those that are unsheltered during the point in time count. It is happening, next slide, at the end of January, January 25th. Um, as I mentioned, our team is working tirelessly to get um, volunteers and talk a bit more about the homeless count. We released data about that um, a month and some change later in the state of homelessness address. So um, it's really helpful to kind of keep a pulse on what, um, at a, a certain point in time, where are people, how many people there are, and some of the other data points in that point in time count. Just a side point too, the PIC count is one of those items where training is provided, a tool, an app is provided mm -hmm. so that it is a, a relatively easy thing for someone who is, doesn't work with housing or homelessness Absolutely. every day to participate. And we need the, the people, the mm -hmm. eyes, the willingness to get out there and cover Dallas County and Cullen County. Uh, absolutely, great, great description. So if you are a person that doesn't work in this space day in and day out, you are partnered with a group, with someone who does work in this space day in and day out. To, as you go and travel about, you're assigned to a census track, right? You're assigned to a census track when you're going out there into the community asking those questions to get that accurate data. 
The next slide just talks about how individuals can help Nissi New, our Chief Operating Officer at Metro Dallas Homeless Alliance. She's one of the team leads for this. Um, it gives a little bit more of information about when the, the COVID-19 kickoff, um, I believe that's gonna be virtually, so that we can continue to maintain those safe COVID protocols. You can also sponsor those blessing bags that are handed out as you're going out to do the survey. Um, the kit provides some of those things that you see listed there. Gloves, hats, toiletries, masks, gift cards. You know, one of the things, uh, Jolene, you got a million things on your plate, tentacles are going, <coughs> excuse me, everywhere. Thank you. They, they're going everywhere. What's been interesting in this whole vaccination distribution is that we can go into communities and we can find churches mm -hmm. and we can set up and there's usually a food pantry that 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 portals through there there's a lot of things that portal through there but what's really interesting has been interesting to me in the last I guess month or so my staff as they've set up in certain communities once they find out we are distributing gift cards, they always seem to be able to penetrate that unsheltered population. They know where they are, you know, they, and, and, and they appear. And of course, you know, for, for the gift cards, I mean, fine, I, I'm, I'm still curious as to what they're going to do with gift cards, you know, but okay. But my point is, is that how are we targeting and charging up those community and census tracts, et cetera, as being part of this alliance? I'll, I'll let Nissy New talk about her engagement tactics around the pit camp. Okay. Hi, yeah, so for us, from our perspective, we're actually just utilizing data that already exists. So we're oh, using- Hold that mic down just a little bit. Who are you now? I'm Nissy New, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Metro okay. Dallas Homeless Alliance. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Um, we're utilizing 311 data. We're utilizing City of Dallas outreach team data and our calling data to really put that map together, to really go into zones that we already know that there are um, unsheltered individuals. And we're gonna assign those to um, nonprofits that already have a lot of that street outreach experience. They have that relationship with the community. They know how to talk to individuals. They know how to keep themselves safe. So those high concentrated areas will be allocated to street outreach staff. I assume too that you're working with our health and human services in order to expand outside the city of Dallas. Is that Absolutely, true? yeah. Uh, we were actually, I was just in an email chain with Dr. Schulte and um, Parkland staff as well to ensure that we keep the community volunteer safe as well as the individuals who are experiencing homelessness Great. safe as Thank well. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Um, I think I just have one more slide left, and that's just a focus on some of the community engagement that we're already doing. Racial equity is huge for us in this space, not only internally as an organization, but looking at the system in the totality of who they're serving um, to continue to keep an eye on that, and data is how we um, continue to, to stay focused on racial equity. Understanding homelessness is a part of our, our regular community engagement tactics so people understand who are we talking about when we talk about our unsheltered? What are some of the interventions and best practices from across the country that may or may not exist here, but how are we continue to lift those things up? And then um, a learning management system that those in the system can continue to have ongoing learning that's taken place, that MDHA, our training, uh, we have a, a training staff member that really lifts up some of those topics that people need, including our case managers might need additional training on. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for your support over the years um, and the time to come and chat with you here today. Thank, well, thank, thank you. you for being here. Thank you for your leadership. Definitely not an easy job. I, I will wait for the data. And thank you, Commissioner Daniels, for your hard work over the years on this issue. I appreciate it a lot to all of you. Well, I definitely appreciate the bringing together of so many partners mm -hmm. because it does take all of us working together and in leveraging those resources so that we, in fact, can accomplish um, more than what we could individually. Um, so I know that our job isn't done yet. Um, and we'll see you at Pit Count. Absolutely. Y'all have a good evening, a good day. Thank you. And just and just when you think it's safe to come out of the house, 
Yeah. I'm going to Rodney King. And what happened in L.A.? The Torrance police bigotry scandal echoes the early days of the L.A. race discrimination. This is in the L.A. Times not 20 years ago, not 30 years ago, less than two days ago. The LA Times, and I quote, the most recent scandal began earlier this year when two Torrance police officers were charged with spray painting a SWAT sticker inside a vehicle. A review of that case led to the discovery of multiple officers sharing vile texts. One of the cops in question was charged in August with shooting an unarmed man in the back. Two others were involved in the shooting death of a black man suspected of driving a stolen vehicle. In the text, officers joked about gas in Jews and assault in gays. Black people were referred to as savages or a variation of the nigger word. One officer said he was out to make, and I quote, Torrance great again, unquote, echoing former President Trump. Another text depicts a photo of a former President Reagan feeding a monkey. And the caption says, Reagan used to babysit former President Obama. Monkeys are historically offensive to African Americans. And hopefully you don't get a monkey mug from Parkland as a gift this season. I just want the record, as I said this morning, to continue to be complete. Thank you, Commissioner Price. Our, our next presentation is from Mike Scarpello on Precinct Lane. Good afternoon, Commissioners, or Judge Jenkins and Commissioners. Uh, last night I sent um, a memo to you regarding the county election precincts. Uh, today I'd like to review that memo and um, answer any questions you might have. As you all know, uh, redistricting takes place every 10 years and um, after the U.S. Census. Um, and after redistricting, election precincts need to be modified um, and, and then approved by commissioner's court. These changes are typically done by the county elections department or some outside agency. After precinct boundaries are adjusted, the information must be input into the county's voter registration system and the state's team voter registration system. This year, the results of the U.S. Census were delayed until August 2021. As a result, it wasn't until October 25th that Governor Abbott signed several Senate and House bills that adopted new redistricting maps. Also, the delayed census results uh, delayed Commissioner's Court from updating political boundaries. Uh, for Commissioner's Court and Justices of the Peace. After all the boundaries were set, it was time to adjust our precinct boundaries. After the 2010 Census, this work was performed by the North Central Texas Council of Governments. That agency no longer provides such services, so this year the Elections Department took on that responsibility. In preparation for uh, redistricting, uh, or re-precincting, uh, we did several things starting in February. Most recently, we re evaluated two Secretary of State advisories released on September 13th and November 1st, and then developed plans to redraw the precincts. In the advisories, um, the Secretaries of State interpreted the election code in the following ways. Um, normally, precinct boundaries shall be ordered by Commissioner's Court before October 1st and shall take effect on January 1st. However, because state redistricting plans were adopted after October 1st, the Secretary of State adjusted 
the deadlines uh, to December 30th. Uh, the law also requires several notices. Generally, after the week in which a county um, the commissioners um, approve the plan, the, the, the plan should be published for three weeks in a, a newspaper. But for counties of a population of one million or more, there's a lot more notice requirements. Uh, not later than the seventh day before the date the commissioner's court meeting at which the changes are considered, the commissioner's court shall deliver written notice of the proposed changes to the county chair of each political party, the political party's precinct chair of each affected election precinct, and the presiding judge for each affected election precinct. But because Dallas County utilizes countywide polling places, the civil division of the DA's office has recommended that we send notice to all presiding judges showing all changes. The code also requires the county to issue a voter registration certificate to each registered voter between November 15th and December 6th. However, SB 13 authorized the Secretary of State to adjust the deadline. As a result, the SOS has determined that certificates should be sent between January 1 and January 12th. And I should mention that they use the word should rather than shall because I think that there are some counties that are struggling to make those deadlines. The elections code also requires a voter registration certificate uh, that contains the jurisdictional information for city and school district election precincts. However, many entities have not finalized their redistricting plans, many cities, et cetera. Uh, consequently, the Secretary of State is allowing the certificates to go out <clears throat> with the name of the city and school district as a whole rather than information about the single member districts. Finally, the Secretary of State stated there will be a second filing period for precinct county chairs from January 15th to February 12th. The election for precinct chairs will be on May 27th rather than March 1st. So that kind of covers the um, interpretation of the laws. Um, the last thing we did to prepare uh, for re-precincting is we worked with the county's voter registration vendor and the Secretary of State to prepare to program the election precincts into the county's VMAX uh, voter registration system and the state's team voter registration system. So where are we at now? Um, after receiving political boundaries from the state and the county, the elections department, using our new GIS team, redrew precinct lines using, using the following methodology. We followed all Texas statutory guidelines. We preserved existing precinct lines and split precincts only when required by state law. We preserved existing precinct numbering scheme utilized in Dallas County in 2013 to the extent possible. And we documented the reasons for the new splits. Uh, fortunately for our county, we have our uh, new GIS team that has uh, done all this work in a very timely fashion in a very short period of time. And the results of those uh, lines are that, th those changes are that we have uh, no changes in 546 precincts. Uh, we have had to renumber 159 precincts because of a change in a commissioner's district. 110 precincts were split by new boundary lines. Five precincts were split <clears throat> were split because of registered voters in the precinct exceeded 5,000. And the result was that in, we had an overall increase from 798 precincts to 885 precincts. After redrawing election precinct lines, um, the, our office developed an online application that allows users to compare 2013 commissioner court boundaries to, to, the, to, to the new commissioner court boundaries. <clears throat> and then compare the 2013 election precincts to the new election precincts. Um, it also allows you to view information about why precinct lines have changed by clicking on the old precinct. And then <clears throat> also reviewing the new precinct numbers. You can also view the Justice of the Peace, House, Senate, Congressional, State Board of Education, and Commissioner Court District lines. On December 12th, we distributed the interactive online application to Commissioner's Court and the political party chairs for recipients to review. Um, at, to date, we have no, had no suggested changes in those lines. Um, that brings us to today. 
So what are our next steps? Um, we have to make any last minute changes to precinct lines that you may be suggesting. Uh, we have to provide state manda mandated notices to certain recipients prior to the next commissioner's court <coughs> actions. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> oh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Scarpelli. You said a few minutes ago that you, you were uh, numbering system was utilized to the extent possible on, on 2013, or is it 2013 or 2012? Uh, it, because I, I couldn't figure out, and um, I know my staff was okay with it, but I, I couldn't figure out how we uh, ran out of numbers and uh, in the so-called increase in precincts and that uh, we had to go to an A-B system. Correct. So I, 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 I don't, I don't it, it does not appear, especially if you go from, well, 2012 or 2013. Um, I, I didn't know how we ran out of numbers. Under the numbering scheme it, th that was developed back in 2012-13, mm -hmm. uh, the first digit is the commissioner's court the commissioner's number, court. Okay. and the second digit is city. Uh, a city. city. And there's, yeah. you know, I think this zero and ones are Dallas, twos, et cetera, identify different cities. Um, because so many lines changed, for instance, from uh, two to three, for instance, um, there's more, um, there's less digits available under the Dallas number zero and one. So well, we, I thought we only changed 159. Well, I, I'd have to sit down with you to go okay. over the exact yeah, number. Yeah, okay. I, I can't get okay. into that detail okay. now, but um, okay, no, okay. Yeah, I mean, our G <clears throat> this is from our GIS folks that, that kind yeah. of ran, spent weeks and on this trying to renumber. Yeah. Okay. You mean so what, what is being observed is that the, the A and B are going to be permanent parts of those specific precincts? If we want to preserve that numbering scheme sure. um, that we utilized okay. back in 2013. And, and I will say that this, uh, you know, we could have just erased all the lines and started from scratch and made even precincts and with new numbers and that would be one approach. But we surveyed the parties and, and some other folks and their their preference was to keep the numbering scheme, keep precincts, keep the same, you know, if you have a precinct chair, there, you know, of those 500 or so, that they don't have any change. And so um, we, we kept that scheme, but it did provide, you know, some, some problematic areas right. where the numbers just didn't work out. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, so we need to set a meeting to get the court order from the commissioner's court finalizing the election precinct lines and numbers. We need to publish and provide additional state mandated notices after that. And then we need to hand key into the state team voter registration system new precincts, renamed precincts, and associated changes related to new, to new federal and state districts. Uh, we need to finalize sub precincts um, after overlaying the city's maps. Uh, finally, we have to contract with our vendor to automate the inputting of 895 precinct to district assignments and 650,000 addressed to precinct assignments. So we're all set up and ready to do that. Um, and then finally, we have to send voter registration certificates to all Dallas County voters by the suggested date of January 12th. Uh, after that, we will continue to process new single member district boundaries when submitted by local cities and school districts and then develop the sub-precincts as needed. And then we have to decide whether or not, when that happens, whether or not we send out new voter registration cards to, to show those uh, sub-precincts. Well, you, you have to, you don't, you don't, it's not like you have a chart. I, I, I guess you divide it <clears throat> in the four precincts. What, what, which, which of our cities have not completed their, quote, redistricting process? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Which, which of our cities have not completed their redistricting process? I believe we've only received uh, redistricting from three cities. From what, how many? Three, I believe. Three? Yeah. Uh, because they're looking for, they're looking toward the elections in May, I'm guessing. Yes. And so for the elections in May, they'll have to submit those re-precincting, or, you know, new districts, uh, very soon in the month of January in order for us to be ready for the May election. If not, they will probably just conduct their elections using their existing boundaries. 
are, is Dallas County going to be able to comply with the requirements, for example, of number eight of sending the certificates out by January 12th? As of now, we, we feel like we can make it. Um, okay. It's going to be a challenge, but and we're working through Christmas and stuff, but we think we can make it. Yeah, elections are all the time. I think just to make it clear, though, what this would require in order to make that deadline, we wouldn't have to have a special commissioner's court meeting um, online to, to gavel these, these precinct lines down. So as, as luck would have it, I'll be here throughout the holiday, so we'll get that set. Yeah, you can do, but, it, on, can do it online. Well, January 11th is the, is the next commissioner's court, right? January the 11th, but I think that's probably too late for this. Isn't? Probably. Yeah, but you can't do it online. Let me, let me. Yeah, well, you, some of you, if you want to attend, can attend online. I have to be here in person. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Let's, let, I want to get the record clear, and I'll, I'll defer to the DA's office. Uh, uh, I, I think it, it, for a quorum and for us to do business, we, uh, we got to have a quorum Quorum's present. You have to have a quorum yeah. present yeah. under the open meetings. So if somebody from their vacation home in Colorado wants to attend this, you know, perfunctory meeting, they I think they can as long as I'm in the building. Uh, well, you have to have a um, you have to have a quorum present, mm -hmm. and those who are participating that are members of the court who are participating by audio visual have to comply with the audio visual requirements that are set forth in the Open Meetings Act from the location at which they are. Yeah. I just want to be much to the meeting and no controversy on that. So as long as we can just get That's two not, people. I mean, I, I just, here, right? he just said something in the record and I just wanted to be real clear. And he said online and they want anybody to go away. Thank you. Now, I, I, I do have a question and um, my understanding <clears throat> is we were going to try to get this on for this court session. We're not able to do so because the Republican Party needs some more time on something, but it is that resolved now? Are we ready to get this on? If not, will that be resolved by next week? Or, you know, nobody's going to, they're not going to be resolving things on Christmas Eve. So what's the plan to get all this in front of us? We just need to get the notice, <clears throat> the notices out to all, <clears throat> excuse me so much. <clears throat> we need to get those notices out to all of those 469 um, Precinct, presiding, presiding judges, judges. Four, yeah. four and, and then we have to provide them with all, okay. all of the changes. <laughs> this delay is, is that resolved? Are we all ready to go now? Uh, once one, once we post the notices, we can go a week later. Oh, so if we can post those notices both today, both parties are ready to go. Yes, yes. Uh, well, we haven't we haven't received any feedback on the precinct lines to say we, we, we disagree with those lines as, as drawn. Well, what, what was the hold up? Why didn't we do this on the 21st then? Because the, the notice requirements for counties of a million or more, yeah. you have to have, uh, you have to notify all those precinct chairs and you have to notify all of the presiding judges. And there was some question about what that well, was, and so we got an opinion from the DA's office on that. So I got some bad information. There's not, neither of these political parties need to do anything else. No. Okay. And I take it that uh, you resolve the uh, co-judge element. Uh, so that would be a different subject <laughs> that okay. I'd be glad to talk okay. about. I, I just got a, I got a ton. Okay, gotcha. Well, Mr. Just... Scarpello, right now, I mean, you're ready to go other than sending all those letters that is required by state law. Once they get it, do they have to respond to you or your only job is for them to get it? And then we're back here voting for you to legally conform with what the state is requirement and have an election. The notice requirement is so that they could come to commissioner's court and in comment, say, hey, you moved my precinct line. I don't want you moving it, that okay. sort of thing. Okay. So and it's for public seven input. day notice, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, when do you need, and we get all the work done comfortably, so we don't, we've got to have a good election, when do you need that to be done? Well, <clears throat> if, if we want to hit the January 12th deadline, I think that we would need to have commissioner's court gavel this down next week. Okay. Um, so if I think there is, can you I, get notice out by tomorrow? Yes. Okay. So tomorrow is the 22nd. 22nd. 
So if we did it a week from the 22nd, it would be on the 29th. Do I have two other people who are going to be on town on the 29th? Yeah, probably. I'll, I'll be, be. I'll be. I'll be. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to shoot for the 29th um, at, I guess, 10 o'clock. Um, it is 29th at 10 o'clock. That's fine. Right. I'm, I'm here. Does that work for you? Great. Judge, okay. let me just make sure. Uh, Russ, do you want to? Because it has to be. Seven days has to expire when the person gets to know it. So unless Mr. Scarpo is confident he can do it today for you to have the meeting on the 29th. Otherwise, we can have the meeting on the 30th, which gives him until uh, okay. tomorrow to yeah, send out the notices. Yeah, it, sa it says not later than the seventh day before the date of the meeting. Well, 22 plus 7 is 29. Well, it has to be at least seven. In other words, seven days has to go. I have it for seven days in my hands. If you send it on the 22nd, you meet on the, 20, on the 29th, you know, yeah. seven is really has I, I'd rather err on the side. Let's sure. stick good Great. on the third. Okay. Do I have three people here on the 30th? I'm here. Which is a Thank Thursday. You. Great. Okay. It's going to be Thursday the 30th at 10 o'clock. Okay. And we're sure we're going to get that. Uh, and and at, at that time, there will also be in, uh, an order on for what we're paying the yes. election judges and other workers. Yes. And paying for for training and all that rigmarole, right? Right. Yeah, and the salary complement as well. Well, well commensurate, you know, with the hell, with what other counties are paying. Uh, well, we, yeah, we have enough trouble holding on to them anyway. So. Where we're at with that is what we have proposed to the parties, and I believe uh, some of the party members have met with some commissioners, is that um, we conduct a joint primary election this year that will be much better for the, the the voters and much more efficient um, and the parties have agreed in principle to most of the requirements and we have drawn up a contract and we have sent that to the parties and they are studying it now and we haven't got their feedback on that contract uh, and they haven't made their final decisions if they do give us their final decisions this week that's something that we could act on um, on that same meeting. And I'll remind you, on the specially called meeting, I think that order and the things that are on there need to be in 72 hours before we meet. So we need to get there. And I realize it's Christmas season, right? But that would mean we would need to get their input back in time for you to do an order. So if possible, if these two political parties or three or libertarians look at this too, or I don't know who looks at it, but... Uh, if everyone that, that wants to have some input could get something back to you before, they, you know, they stop for Christmas. Yeah, and and do keep it. in mind, if we don't get that for this next meeting, we could do that on January 11th, that we'd be okay. Okay. So the things that you have to get done, just so we make sure we're real clear for the record, that have to be done on the 30th is the precinct lines, and that's it. That's correct. All right, anybody got anything else? No, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you, thank you very much. I would much. like to get the money part of it done on the 30th because the political parties are going to be recruiting people, and until that is clear that we're going to pay, I forget, what what did we pay last time? Last last time uh, we paid... Uh, 16, 16 and 16. Six, 16, 16 to the third, 16 dollars. Eighteen dollars we paid to the uh, judges. Correct. Eighteen yeah. for judges, sixteen for clerks. The the state only reimburses twelve dollars. Right. right. And so can we it, make it, up the difference? As long as the Republican and the Democratic Party are not sure they're gonna, it's hard to recruit people and say, hey, you want to work for maybe sixteen dollars, but it could be twelve, because mm -hmm. yeah. the answer is going to be different depending right. on the amount. Of money. I agree. Right. Yeah. Other counties are paying it, and uh, I think we need to as well. And with the shortage of people that actually want to work at this point, that is a big concern. Yeah. For the 450 yeah. something locations that we have to cover. Yeah, encourage the political parties to do whatever they need to so we can put that dollar amount on there. But help us help them because it's going to be so much easier for them to recruit the sufficient number of people yep. if they're being paid more money and if they're being paid to sit through training and whatnot. That's going to make it easier for them and it's their primaries they need to recruit people so right. let's hurry and get their their people more money so they can do their jobs easier right okay 
So there's a consensus pretty much on that, Mr. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So they can say it, because I can imagine hiring someone without telling them how much I'm going to pay them for sure. Exactly. Oh, okay. you don't have to worry. You won't be able to hire no mm -hmm. that many people. No. Well, Please, bilingual else? people. And I assume that you'll keep us posted if there are changes that occur between now and then. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Chris. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. This takes us to our consent agenda. Is there a request to pull sheriff's personnel for a separate vote? Yes. Okay. Move right. is presented. Uh, and we did pull collateral. Well, you're not pull collateral. I'm just, you know, you know I, I guess it looks like everybody's in the same dead gum box with that Bank of America stuff, that collateral. But I, I, I just can't can't find myself voting for it. But okay, I will. Well, I will. I will as a Christmas present to Bank of America one time. Otherwise, I'm, I really don't give a damn. But, you know, it's just, I mean, none of them. All of them in the same boat. We, we come to a resolution, I know. Finally, but it still ain't on the docket. And we still haven't got a $7 million escrow. So, but I'll, I'll support it. Let's, let's just go far. Let's go far. Is there a motion on consent of Janice? Sheriff Kirsten. So moved. Second. All those in favor, you know, say aye. 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 Is there a motion on sheriff's personnel? I move. Second. Is there any discussion? Uh, yes. Um, on commissioners, uh, you know, staff, I know that I have talked to uh, Mr. Henderson as well as Mr. Wilson, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, obviously, um, some of the uh, issues that I have discussed with Mr. Henderson is about veteran services for uh, Residents that are veterans. Uh, I know residents that are what? That are veterans. Oh, veterans. Okay. Okay. Uh, I got you. I'm sorry. I mean, and I'm going to support you know him being the director. I know that they have been a, a lot of challenges uh, within the services, especially during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. However, a lot of uh, veterans that are residents are most of the time. Uh, not always, obviously, um, having some issues that can range from PTSD, addictions, other issues. And um, sadly, sometimes when they go through the criminal justice um, you know, system, they finish deported. And they, they finish what? deported, deported. Mm -hmm. and, and most of the time in the border region, and most of the time they are prey for some of the, uh, you know, I want to say uh, narcos uh, system. So uh, it's one of the things that I have discussed with Mr. Henderson. I know that several organizations like, like LULAC have been uh, going and providing some of those services that they need. I mean, they serve these countries not fair that they don't have the support system to be in this country, even if sometimes, you know, some of the um, services are there. Uh, so I know that uh, Mr. Henderson have been talking uh, about these services and of course the importance to have someone that speaks Spanish cannot be understated. I think that we have seen in today's agenda how important these services are and how important it is for uh, people in Dallas County to access a lot of the services when they don't trust government or when they cannot speak the language. And that's why my push about diversity for Dallas County and reflecting the population is so important. So with that being said, I wanna thank uh, Roman Palomares, you know, director of LULAC with Veteran Services, as well as Mr. Heichel and Mr. Ser and Mr. Henderson for <coughs> starting to look into these issues. Uh, I definitely, one of the other issue that was mentioned is, um, you know, using the office in the uh, new Oak Cliff Government Center as to provide some of these services during the week. So with that being said, I think in a capsule, I, is, I, you know, I wanted to put this on the record because I expect some changes uh, when it comes to this. And Mr. Heichel, did I forget anything? Mr. Henderson, I know you're here and, and you wanted to probably put something on the record as well, so. Commissioner, uh, no, we've had, and by we, myself and Mr. Henderson, comprehensive conversation about the need for um, the Veterans Department. 
uh, both to spread the news that the Veterans Office is there uh, to help a cross-section of our community. Some things we talked about because, you know, now we have local offices in each of your respective districts. Um, we are going to be staffing the one in Commission of Conscious District, we hope, sometime in January. And um, I stress to Mr. Henderson, given the South Dallas office location, it's probably need to have an additional person there who speaks Spanish so that when the veteran's spouse comes in, sometimes, um, you know, on behalf of the veteran, we can facilitate better uh, communication. We're also going to work with Judge Collins in the Veterans Court. There's a series of things we've talked about um, with Mr. Henderson that he was already planning and doing, and, and he's here asking to come to put in the record some of the things the department's about to do and is doing to reach a broad cross-section of the community. First of all, Commissioners, uh, Judge, um, I take this opportunity very, very seriously. Um, just to give the court a little bit about myself, uh, I'm a 25-year um, Army veteran. Uh, once I retired from the military, I knew at that time that I wanted to continue to uh, be, a, be a support for the constituents, uh, uh, the, the people that I have served with, and that developed into the veterans. Uh, I got this, uh, I came to, the, to Dallas County while I was actually on um, vacation leave, so I really didn't have a vacation from, uh, from my retirement from, from the military and came directly here. I've been in this department since 2007, uh, so I am very, very familiar with some of the concerns and issues the, that have, um, that are with the department and also uh, concerns and issues that, here, that, that we want to take care of here in Dallas County. One of our main concerns is to ensure that veterans within the county are taken care of. This is going to take um, also the help from each one of my commissioners. Uh, I will be, once the, um, this holiday season has uh, gone, uh, gone by, I will be uh, getting in contact with each one of you because I have a vision that in order to get the word out, we've been, well, we've been trying to get the word out to that 109,000 veterans that we have here in Dallas County for years. It's going to take all of us and it's going to take help from each one of you. What I uh, propose and what I'm going to be proposing is that in each one of the districts, as Mr. Heichel alluded to, we now will have a veteran service officer in that particular district. That service officer is going to be working very diligently with the commissioners because what I want to happen is for the commissioners, anytime there's any events, anything that's going on in your particular district, that veteran service officer should be a part of whatever is happening. That way, you can get the, the word can get out that there is a veteran service officer in that district that can assist. One of the uh, um, main concerns that, uh, that that I have right now is. Uh, Commissioner Garcia, we, what we want to do is, I, I, I definitely uh, understand your concerns. I definitely understand the concerns. However, uh, the border issue is a little bit above my head. Uh, I have to fall under the rules and the regulations of the Department of Veteran Affairs when we're looking at any type of benefits that are associated with the veteran population. If the veteran has the if they're eligible based off of their tenure in the service, then we can service them. The issue with servicing any veterans that have been deported, once a uh, veteran files a, any type of claims with the Department of Veteran Affairs, there's a process that um, has to happen for health care. That is the issue that the federal government is dealing with right now with any deportations. Because if you're deported, now you have to get the health care in order to get the benefits. And that's the situation that we are unfortunately uh, faced with. Once that veteran, once that person has come back to the United States, come back across the border, we can service them because they are veterans and the benefits 
they have not lost the benefits. Those benefits come from Department of Defense. The Department of Veteran Affairs is the administrator of the, of the benefits. So once we get them back, they are serviced. And we can continue to uh, uh, get whatever type of benefits that they may be eligible for. Can we talk about uh, being proactive about that? Talk to families. Is your military family member about to be uh, released and then kind of get ahead of the game so that we don't have to go through that deportation process? Well, mm -hmm. the deportation process is, we really don't have a, 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 a say in the deportation mm -hmm. process. Well, it, it sounds How, like it's a long conversation, so exactly. I'd like to follow up just to see if there, if there are any options on this. Because I certainly agree with Dr. Garcia in, in being very aware of mm -hmm. veterans who then subsequently get uh, deported. Um, would also like to uh, look at, because the, the issue that's being looked at here in number seven is, is employment across the board right. and what we are doing um, to provide recruitment in, in a multi-language, a multilingual method mm -hmm. so that we are addressing <laughs> all of the residents of Dallas County and not just those who um, <clears throat> speak English. Yeah, but I don't want to saddle this department, I, and, and I, I agree with all that, but you know, we, we're, we're saddling and we're talking about getting into areas of which he has, I mean, even this court, if I remember correct, with regards to ICE, detainments, with what's going on in the Veterans Court, was it Judge Collins' court? We don't have anything to say about it. Well, That's a whole nother level of government. I and, and I understand, Commissioner, but I mean, it's, it's the issue about how can we make veterans and veterans' families, you know, how can we educate them about the services that Dallas County provides before okay. some of this happens, obviously, yeah. and hopefully to avoid that this happens. And I think Mr. Henderson is on the right track about, hey, let's first of all get into every single district at, of the court okay. and start seeing what is the need out there. I mean, how many, I mean, the reality, the federal government doesn't allow him to track ethnicity. Right. So it makes this job even harder. So yes. I think getting into the community, target the areas that we want to do, target the veterans sectors that we want to target, it's a, per, it's a good first step. And exactly. I mean, I'm willing exactly. and able to work with yes. Mr. Henderson right. and his staff to make this happen. And thank you so much, Mr. Henderson. Hopefully we can have a presentation about veteran services by February of next year, give you some time to put it together, hopefully getting into all the road and bridges and or, you know, the different uh, districts and go from there. And we are all law-abiding citizens here, and I think we feel that very strongly. But I also want to take a look at what can we do? What is within the purview of the law um, on these particular issues? Um, just to do that exploration a little well, bit. Well, Commissioner Daniel, uh, just to say this last little bit here, you know, as uh, Commissioner Price alluded to, on a lot of issues, my hands are, well, our hands are completely tied. I, I appreciate uh, that. I appreciate that. But there mm -hmm. also is a responsibility on all yes. of our part to um, do what is best for the residents of Dallas County. And so I at least want to explore what, what it is, what is our responsibility and what can we do? Okay. Um, let me say this. When we're, when, 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 when we're at, uh, uh, when, when we're looking at veterans, two things that we have to consider. One is benefits. The other is going to be, um, not benefits, but they are, mm, best way to say this here. Eligibility for services. Benefits are mandated by the Department of Veteran Affairs. There's nothing I can do about the benefits. They're there. You've earned the benefits by your, time, by your tenure in the military. Now, as far as resources, that's where the county comes in. Mm -hmm. Because now, with the resources, we can assist with the benefits. But however, you must be eligible for the benefits in order to reap the benefit of the resources. So it's sort of a 
catch-22 here. Yeah. And, and all of that will be addressed, uh, as I stated, when uh, I get to speak with each one of you, or what I'd like to do first is have everybody collectively. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. Thanks. Uh, personnel, approval of personnel. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He, she called personnel. He, he made him show of personnel. He yeah, got I moved a second. Yeah. A second. You yep. did. So yeah. just call the question. All, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Oh, wait a second. No, you, sheriff personnel, you vote no, right? Uh, yes. Okay, that's a no. And then I abstain. She abstains, okay. So. So there's two abstentions, one no, two yeas. Um, uh, yeas have it. Okay, so now that takes us to uh, quarters one through 41, pulling four and 34 for separate votes. Uh, um, okay. Motion uh, on that. One and 44, right, Kim? Yeah. You, you said pulling what? Four and 34? Four and 34 for separate votes. Okay. okay. And 27, oh, Judge. Okay, and 27 percent of the vote. Okay. Um, yeah, because I just got a comment on 25. Okay, then I'll uh, I'll move I'll move I'll move the court order, with the exception. Do you guys want to base it? Come again? Do you guys want to base it? No. Oops. Nope. Oh. No, my bad. My bad. Okay. okay. Well, Let's go back and get the bids real fast. Bids. Uh, is there a motion on the bids? Bid. Second. All those in favor, see the vote. I say aye. I kind of comment on, on bids. Uh, I, I just want to say that uh, on item number four, authorize the purchase of law enforcement and administrative fleet um, for vehicles or various county departments. I am very happy to see that even when we only have, you know, two green vehicles, Thank you so much uh, to Mr. Bassan and administration. Uh, we are starting to look at some of the law enforcement vehicles. I know that it, for a long time they have chosen, uh, you know, the cars for um, uh, law enforcement. However, uh, we're looking into some of the vehicles well, that will be green this, vehicles for buy, pursuit. Yeah, buy, buy, buy them a few Teslas. They, they, they're fast. Ah, they're fast. there you go, Commissioner. Yeah, okay. that, that's a second. I didn't want to say the brand, yeah. but now that it's on record, not by me, by Commissioner Price, um, you know, those cars now, I mean, in the past, law enforcement have had concerns about green vehicles because of the speed. Now, you know, Tesla Commissioner Price is one of the fastest cars yeah, that there is. I so I will not mention the, num the fastest car because there's some, you know, disagreements in my family about it. But, um, you know, Teslas are pretty fast now. Yeah. So with that being said, thank you to budget, to Mr. Bassan and administration for making this happen. I mean, the world, we need to protect our environment, and this is a good first step to move towards that goal. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Call the question, Call Judge. The question. Well, I think we've already voted on bids, haven't we? Well, she said she had a comment and we were getting ready to. Okay, well, let's vote on it again. All those in favor, see what I was saying. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Okay. Again, that takes us back to court orders. We've got court order L1 for 41, mm -hmm. pulling 4, 27, and 34 for separate votes. Is there a motion? And I so move. Second. Right. Any discussion on that? Let me just say on, on 25 and Dr. Wong, I don't know if you're <clears throat> still listening. You know, I, I look at these these numbers. We just talked about this in civil service this morning as we continue to approve, approve millions and millions of dollars of ARP funds. But look, on this 340B program, um, I, I'm sure we all need to know how we're going to use this money to access and improve the outcome. What I want to do is I want to request a um, semi-annual report uh, if the income received that was spent, <clears throat> how, it was, how it was spent, and, 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 and what increases the access and better outcomes. You know, we, we, we put our... Um, a lot of other providers who are getting this 340B money, they're putting their money in, in PrEP and drugs for uninsured. Uh, and, and we're saying we're passing off these cheaper medication costs to patients, which tells me that 
this plan used the income offset costs. So how does that equate to outcomes cited? So I'm having a little sure. I'm having a little trepidation here that uh, the purpose of the 340B program is how you will use the income generated, what will be the impact on it besides buying more staff. And I, I know sure. you still got 100 folks, 50 folks. We got, we got staff and staff and more staff. And I just want to make sure that we're not taking this 340B money and not uh, just buying more staff. So I guess I'm asking for a report uh, if every you know couple of two or three months uh, that will talk about how we're using this 340 uh, B program money. Because yeah, we, we can definitely provide that. Uh, you know, I mean, it is uh, restricted for use uh, uh, to support the program. I think, uh, I think, I believe it's the, these funds that have been used for stuff like promoting prep. Uh, we've had advertisements in the Dallas Observer uh, and other efforts, uh, social media, uh, to increase the um, uh, demand and education about prep. Uh, but we can definitely provide that um, information to you. Well, that's fine. And, and I didn't mean to, I, I don't want to uh, pigeonhole you just to, you know, to prep. I just want to see at the end of the day the offsets, how we're going to use the income generated uh, to, to, to impact besides buying more staff. I want to make sure that it gets to our constituents as opposed to, you know, we, we you know, because you, you got administrative staff plugged into it. Okay? Okay, thank you. That I just need to come in for the record. He, he responded. Thank you. I just have one quick question and one observation. Did I see, was Charles here? Do, 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 do. Yeah. Here he is. On, on uh, court order number five, it is a, a ARP um, contra, um, award, I guess, and there was uh, one point. One point eight. There are ninety. There's ninety million. I mean, sorry, ninety thousand dollars that are considered other costs. That seems like a very large number that is just lumped into other costs. Okay. I don't have that answer off the top of my head. Is this part of a larger budget? I can get that for you. I can tell you that what you're approving right now is a go forward for staff to initiate contract okay. uh, workout. And so you will see it again before okay. any, any funds are expended. Uh, just, as, uh, just in general, though, try to stay out of the budget building process for nonprofits when we are uh, looking for proposals from them. Uh, but I will get that answer for you before we present the contract like for commissioner's court number, approval. That's all. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reardon. Um, obviously, you're working with the different organizations that do this program, so I appreciate it. I guess this gives you the opportunity to see what's the right number for this program, and I'm glad to see it. Um, also, additional personnel, uh, item number six for the American Rescue Plan. I want to thank you and your team and everybody that is helping. I mean, obviously, we have a task in front of us, and I do understand the need for additional personnel if we want to be sure that all these bits and all this uh, money that is going to be dispersed is accountable not only to our constituents but to the uh, federal government as well. So I will just ask you of the, of the need of bilingual personnel in all these positions as well as, um, you know, all the um, items that have, that are looking for hiring additional personnel. That is uh, item also number 24, uh, Dallas County Health and Human Services. Uh, seems like we are hiring, and I want to be sure that that message is out there loud and clear. Uh, because we need people to work in these programs and the way that uh, to help not only in the service area but also in the health area. And I also wanted to um, make a comment about the, um, when it comes to facilities, we continue to move and you will see colleagues, uh, several items you know, with uh, competition for um, 
Health and Human Services, the eighth floor renovation, and I want to thank uh, and the Cotrell Hernandez building. I know these have been very challenging uh, projects, but I want to thank Mr. Bassan and the Facilities Department for uh, moving these issues uh, forward. And um, uh, last but not least, you know, we're adding $3 million for um, housing assistance. Uh, Mr. Reed, I know that we have asked you for those numbers uh, constantly. If you just got, can keep us posted on how we're doing with those funds. It, yes, ma'am. On the mortgage assistance, uh, did include the performance of that uh, specific piece in the briefing. Uh, we are one of a few counties that are still doing mortgage assistance uh, to our residents. We have a number of folks that are in the program. We'd like to continue them, get them the same 12 months that our renters are getting. And so that actually funds the mortgage piece through the end of next uh, calendar year. I think Thanks. Dallas County's role in mortgage assistance and the partnerships that have been developed with nonprofits and with the private sector is it's a huge uh, movement forward. And you're absolutely right. I think it is relatively um, uh, uh, unheard of across the country. So thanks for all the efforts that you've put into doing that. Thank you, Mr. Reed. And those are my comments. Yes. I have one observation to make on number 10, and it's a, it's a huge shout out to the variety of, of Dallas County folks, Parkland, Homeward Bound, um, uh, MD, uh, 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 NIPA, just the partnership that's required to, to have the Dallas County Deflection Center actually uh, become a reality. And I know that this is, this is just, this is the one piece of the contract between Dallas County and Homeward Bound, but it takes all of those little pieces coming together in order for us to get, go forward. A point of reality on this, you know, we hear about supply chain issues. The actual opening of this facility is probably going to be delayed because of the problems in getting windows. And it's just a point of reality, but it's, it's frustrating to know that the real world sometimes uh, it's interferes stuck. with us moving forward on these things. So, but this is a step. Okay, Commissioner. Any other, any other concerns? Comments? Hearing Been moved and second. All those in favor, let me know by you sign the voting. Aye. Those who are opposed, same sign. Chairs in the affirmative. Now we're going to item number four. Number four, back and forth. That's okay. you, Commissioner. Okay, number four. Bank of America. Number four. I said uh, <clears throat> Bank of America. Um, uh, move approved. Secure, it was a security piece. Well, right? oh, that's right. You, you. Uh, I, I, I went on and went forward on that. Okay, what, what's the next one? So, so item four, which is a bill of security. What? Oh, security maintenance. Except for a separate vote? Yes, for okay. the x-ray equipment. Well, for D Dr. Garcia, for vote. Dr. Garcia, that was pulled by staff, not for okay. a separate okay. vote, but pulled, pulled for two by weeks staff. while staff evaluates the agreement. Oh, okay. okay, I Got thought it. it was... Got it. Okay. okay. So it's a, well, it was a different number four on the consent agenda of what Commissioner Price wanted. Right, exactly. This was pulled, building security was pulled by staff. Did right, I get yeah. that correct? Okay. Right. So, then, the then we go to item number 27. 27, 27 yeah. Uh, 27 is... It's an exemption, so somebody has to move. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm moving. Let me I'll check that real fast. Is that an exception or is that a typo? How is it an exception to give somebody unpaid leave who has a family leave act deal but hasn't qualified yet? Don't we do that all the time? It's item number 27 on the chart. I see what you're saying, that we put it down that way, but I don't believe that is actually an exception to policy. Well, it was discussed in executive session last time, and I thought it was one. Judge Adam, uh, I don't know if Mr. Wilson's here. Um, I mean, this, it was discussed in December 7, the closed session. Yeah, but I, I just don't think it's an exception, yeah. but um, she's going to vote against it if it is an exception, but how could it be an exception? We do this all the time. Somebody comes to work here, they don't have enough time yet, they get sick, we put them on unpaid leave. I'm, I'm not sure it's that one. 
judge. But with that being said, it will pass anyway. Yeah, it's going to pass anyway. That's that's fine. I'm oh. not sure we wrote it. Right. Is Commissioner Price, you moved? Yeah, I moved it. It's been moved and seconded, right? Okay. All yeah. those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Motion carries four to one. Um, 34, I think staff is pulling. Yeah, yes, sir. If uh, can we please pull item 34? This is the renewal for the parking garage vendor. While I we work with purchasing to further evaluate uh, some of the issues there. Good. Thank you. Okay, okay. and uh, that's it. Um, we have some two speakers. Two. Uh, I don't seem to have my list. Yeah. A job, yeah. I hear this. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Two uh, the first speaker is G. Jackson. Right. Um, Judge, read yeah, the rules. Get the rules. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, please read the rules of the quorum for our public speakers. All commission of court attendees are hereby advised that this meeting is conducted in accordance with the provisions of Dallas County Code, Section 74-71. Visitors and registered speakers are to preserve order and decorum at all times. Personal, profane, or slanderous remarks are not appropriate and will not be allowed at any time during this public meeting. Any and all applause is to be kept brief in observance of time constraint. Disruptive visitors and registered speakers may be removed and are subject to the penalties provided in the state of Texas Penal Code, sections 38.13, 42.01, and 42.05. Registered individual speakers are limited to a maximum of three minutes, and the maximum discussion on any one topic is limited to 30 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and our first speaker is G. Jackson. Uh, Mr. I'm not sure who, if it's a man or a woman. G. Period Jackson. G. Period Jackson. All right. Our next speaker is Mr. Robert Cigarelli. Do we have to get him on the phone? Mm. Mr. Robert Cicarelli? You know, why would we have to get him on phone? That that order's been lifted. Yeah. And uh, for somebody to not participate, uh, it needs to they need to be audio visual, even a member of the public, not just telephonic. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Robert Cicarelli, Mr. Robert Cicarelli. All right, so that concludes our public speakers. In a moment, we will uh, begin our closed session, and uh, we would ask that those who are not here for the first items on the closed session to leave the courtroom at this time. We'll get that switch over to closed session. Thank you.
His comments on the... Hey, well, Tim, we'll see him next time. I think somebody in the litigation with us. Yeah. Who? Okay. Oh, okay. Who's that? Something about um, Supreme what Justice League. Oh. Uh, um, and is... Um, well, that's it. The clerk is coming to thank the record. All right. Now, ready, guys? Have a joyous Christmas. Yeah. You ready? Ready? All right. Court, court is adjourned. Everyone have a good holiday. Thank you.